Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to the regular meeting of the Board of Trustees, Tuesday, February 20th. I'd like to welcome a call for attendance. Mr. Kaling? Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson? Here. Mr. Quadro? Here. Dr. Bonner? Present. And Mayor Ciara will not be here today. Can we all stand for a pledge of allegiance? to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good <coughs> Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School is to prepare students for social responsibility, employment, and post-secondary education through rigorous applied technical and academic programs. Thank you. Is there any participation by the public this evening? Hearing none, participation by the trustees. Yeah, I have a short report on the most recent board meeting of the Collaborative for Educational Services. Their communications team creates an annual summary of key stories, images, and accomplishments for the board and to share widely. This is CES's 50th anniversary year, and so they have an expanded version. It's just beautiful, and if we ever want a PR tool like this done for us, we should absolutely talk to them and do it in-house. The Collaborative has a statewide contract to educate young people in the care of the Department of Youth Services. After several years laying the groundwork, Berkeley College of Music is now offering music scholarships to DYS students. The program allows them to earn college credit by taking online music courses that are taught remotely by Berkeley professors. There are 24 students enrolled at Heck Academy on Pleasant Street from 10 member districts and 7 non-member districts. And the Beacon program in Greenfield will kick off its entrepreneurship apprenticeship this month. Students in this alternative program are organizing a pop-up shop where they'll showcase and sell their beaded jewelry. And Beacon will expand to all of Franklin County for the 2024-25 school year. And Mr. Chair, um, I'd like to propose a change to the agenda because this is a rescheduled meeting and the executive session negotiations on the agenda are significant. I think it's important for all five trustees to be present. So I move that we postpone the executive session to after our next regularly scheduled board meeting on March 26th. I need a second. Well, um, but how can you guarantee there's going to be everybody here? Uh, no guarantee. But this was a... Um, yeah, I understand what you're saying. And the, we we have, have a quorum, correct? Um, we have a quorum. Yeah. I would like to go forward. Okay. So, um, so there was no second. Now we had discussion. Well, there is there. I second. Oh, great. Right. Okay, I'm sorry. Just when you have a motion for the discussion. Then I guess we need to have a motion. I uh, motion to go to discussion. After it's second, it goes right to discussion. Okay. Well, um, go ahead. No, you go. No, it's just that. I understand where, you're, where, where your concern is, Joe, and I really believe that if we have a quorum, uh, because of the other meeting getting canceled because of the snowstorm, and we scheduled this meeting, and this is an agenda item, I believe it should be brought up and came up tonight. Respectfully disagree. It was, um, we didn't have any choices for uh, options of when the meeting would take place. And it's during school vacation week. Um, which we, we are school, um, but folks didn't, it was, it was relatively short notice, hard for people to rearrange things, and um, this, this is an important negotiations. And after the, the mayor's um, budget report to the joint uh, meeting recently, I think it's important for um, the mayor to be there, for sure. I mean, we're a city department. I think she ought to participate in these negotiations. All right. Um, can, are we in a discussion stage? Yes. So I can make comment? Yes. I agree with both where you guys are coming from, and I think 
I don't know, Julie may have a stronger argument. We need to wait until the mayor's here. Well, I'd like to call for a roll call vote for the trustees on this matter. Mr. Kaling? I say I'd like to move forward. Mr. Quadro? Um, I'd say we hold for now. Dr. Spencer Robinson? So I say yes to the motion of postponement to the next regular scheduled meeting. Dr. Bauman? I would like to wait and postpone until the next scheduled meeting. I think all of this all right, and then if, if, if there's, for whatever reason, the mayor is not here, we're going to move forward. Is the house that? Is that an agreement? I'm fine. What do you think? Uh, absolutely, I do. All right. Okay. All right, so we're to the vote or be tabled, correct? Postponed. Postponed. Okay, we'll go postponed. postponed. All right. All right, okay. So post, all right, gotcha. So it's postponed to the next meeting. <clears throat> all right, so there was something you said earlier, Julie, in that report you're given that sparked my interest about something. Great. So what I don't, I can't remember what it was. I lost my train of thought. Yeah. Um, and what you were just, your report yeah. you gave. So the students in the Department of Youth Services taking college classes at right. Berkeley College of Music or the Heck Academy on Pleasant Street and the Beacon Program or the PR materials that they produce? Um, all of the above. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was a lot covered up in the Heck that I thought would be most relevant there. All right. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on. Thank you. So at this point, we have, uh, may have a motion in a second to approve the minutes of the January 23 Board of Trustees meeting. So moved. Second. Any additional discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 At this time, I'd like to highlight the athletics and co-op. And Andy, you know. yeah, we have Mr. Lago here, our athletic yep. director and co-op coordinator. I, I think I know everybody here except for the new superintendent. I'm Jeff LaRoe. I'm the athletic director and the co-op coordinator. Um, going on my uh, 24th year here, so I've been around for a while. Started out as a manufacturing instructor and now I'm doing co-op and athletics. So I'm just going to give you a quick, quick overview of this year's seasons, what's going on and where the team's finished. And then I'm going to kind of give you a breakdown just to show you, we did some research with Dr. Lincoln Hoker and Mr. Bianca asked me to do some research and we looked back for the last three years just to see how many students are coming here for athletics. So it's pretty fascinating to see the amount of numbers rise for the last three years and it, it kind of goes hand in hand with the amount of students that are here that are coming in and, and getting closer to that you know, 600 student mark. Um, it shows how much sports has risen over those years. <clears throat> um, so. This year, um, the fall season, um, just so you know, um, for superintendent from Northampton, we, we offer girls soccer, boys soccer, football, cross country, which is mixed, boys and girls, and volleyball. Those are the sports we offer in the fall. So I'm glad to report that our girls team finished 10-2-2 and and made it to postseason. So it was a good season again this year for us, for the girls, and there was plenty of girls to participate, and I'll go over numbers with you in a little bit. Um, boys soccer, uh, they ended up 12-5-1, and one, and that, these, are, these are league records, not overall. They also made it to postseason. They went to the Vogue tournament, and they won the league this year. So we haven't won the league in 20 to 23 years. So it was back from Mr. Tujin, was a teacher here years ago. The last time they won the soccer was in 2000. So... Great, uh, great showing for them. Football, we finally broke into uh, uh, winning season. Uh, I'm proud about that. We had a lot of participants. Uh, we finished seven and five in the regular season, and then we moved forward and played a game in the, in the postseason. So it, it was great for us to finally do that. Cross country, unfortunately we don't have enough girls. We only have one girl that runs, so we really can't participate in the girls' end of it, but she runs anyways. Um, we had our most participation for males we had 15 this year and they had their best season ever 
and cross country is individualized. So, but they finished six and four in their league. That's the best we've ever done. Um, girls volleyball, we also had a great season. They made it the postseason as well, and they finished 11 and 10. So that's the fall record. Winter to date, um, we're playing tonight, so I can't give you all everything. But tonight is a PVAC uh, play-in game, so it's a it's a semi-playoff game. Um, right now, the boys basketball team is eight and 11. The girls basketball team is 11 and six, and they're going to get a game in the state championship. Well, not in the state games. They're not not in a champion match, but they're going to get a state game this year. And our wrestling, it sounds like a not not a lot. It was three three and one. But the problem is wrestling wrestles every weekend on Saturdays, and they go out. They're all over the place. So they, they, those students will wrestle five or six matches in one day. So it's kind of hard when you look at the league numbers. It's very small because they only have seven league matches during the year. But they travel on weekends, and then they have Western Mass, uh, vocational tournament, states, and all states. We had three students participate in um, all states last, I mean, states last week. One of them is moving on to all states next, this weekend. So, uh, you know, all around really good. Sport spring numbers, uh, students are starting to register now. Um, it looks like that we will have quite a few. We are offering, just so you know, we have softball, baseball, boys lacrosse, and we're starting, I think we're going to finally have enough this year to start the girls lacrosse team. We're going to play independently, and we got a co-op with East Hampton High. So they're going to have about five girls come over. So I think we're going to have 15 to 16 girls play. Question, and we have, a, yeah. we have a coach. What's, what's the team co-ed? Last year, yes. Because they couldn't field both. Yes. One, two girls played on the boys' team last and year. They did that, what, a couple years? A couple years, yep. And we had right. some girls that didn't want to play on the boys' team, so we had a coach that just ran practice three days a week, and it was just like a practice squad just to keep them interested so we wouldn't lose them so we could start the program. So, so, how did how did you manage that? That the girls have to play by the boys' rules? Yes. All yeah. right. Yeah. Because I've seen both sides. So yeah, it's, it's a different. totally different game. Yeah. Um, I know. So I think the girls are really excited that they're going to be able to play <coughs> the girls' team this year. So no, that's kind of a breakdown. As far as the um, just to give you an idea, the number wise, when I did some research for uh, Dr. Lincoln Hulker and Mr. Bianca, back in 2021, we had. 238 student athletes, and that was for all three seasons. In 2022, we had 299. And then this year we're projecting, with spring coming and registrations, I feel there's about 80 students that are gonna to apply um, to play sports. We're, we're gonna be around 306. So I feel like it's a good representation of how sports is rising here and that kids are coming here because we're offering some of the sports that they wouldn't be able to play in some of the other, some of, if they stayed in their traditional high school. So it's, it's really good to see that we build that much. And I think some of the success, just to give you an idea, so last year our baseball team, two years in a row now has won Western, has won the small state vote championship, has made it to the finals in Western Mass and has won the league two years in a row. Um, our basketball team won last year. Our girls' soccer team won the league the year before. Great. So I think students are starting to come here because they see that. They know that we're legitimate programs now. All right, I have a couple questions. Sure. I was wondering that too. Do you really think they come here for the sports or for the overall vocational academics? Well, experience? I think it's both. I think it's both because the co-op numbers are going to show that as well. Yeah. Um, but I feel like some of the students that are coming here, we're getting more students that will play a sport versus where they used to come just for the vocational training. Yeah, yeah. But I feel like they're doing both now because they're not giving up being able to play football or lacrosse or volleyball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that we offer those. We never how, used to offer those years ago. Yeah, our how did, our how survey how information shows... <clears throat> Sports might not be what brings them here, yeah, yeah, but right. it'll keep them from coming if they don't have that. Sport. Right, right, right. Um, how's it cut into the co-op program? Because that must be difficult juggling sports yeah. and co-op. It's actually surprising well that students do come back. And, and the nice thing is I do both of them. So I always talk That's to the employers when I go out, and I always say, you know, a lot of these students want to play, at, you know, be part of an athletic team. 
So I ask them if they can be forgiving, like letting them out yeah, two yeah, o'clock yeah, yeah. for games. And I feel like all of the people that I've spoke to out in industry are fine with that as long Positive as they have the heads up. As long as they oh, get the game great. schedule. So. Can I just? And um, can I just? I just want to say um, to your point, data shows across the state that participation in athletics at vocational schools drops off at senior year. Um, but I do want to give Jeff a lot of credit and uh, our department heads. All right. They well, do encourage those kids in, through those employers to come back and finish and have a whole high school experience. And the employers, they, they back that. Right, 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 right. So why do you think it drops off their senior year? Because they've gotten a job? It's employment. Yeah, yeah. that's what the data yeah. shows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. <clears throat> yep. I have a, a couple questions. Sure. Um, and I just I wanted to let Dr. Bonner know a little bit of the history of football. I was um, an eighth grade teacher in Northampton, and so knew anecdotally of the number of students who, um, when Smith Folk did not have football, we didn't have a football program for a while, and it was kind of um, anemic, I would say, for for a while. Also, that students had to make it. They wanted to come here for vocational no, education, but they wanted to play football. And so they, would, you know, that was tough for them. And so to have the program be yeah. as robust as it is means they don't have to make that choice anymore. Um, but one, my first question is um, wondering about how, like, is, is competition from football good for athletics or not? So thinking about downtown Northampton, um, some people would say we don't want any more restaurants because there's only so many diners, and you know we you're, we're spreading the no, around. No, we need more north. restaurants. And then other folks would say no. The more restaurants there are, there are it'll be known as a restaurant destination. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering about football because also the numbers of participants in football, they're huge, they're much bigger than for any other sport. So does that? Do you, in your professional opinion, do you feel like the football program is? taking from other sports potentially? Do other coaches maybe look at it com competitively? Or do they? is it more like, no, we're, we are becoming really known more as a school where you've, we've got a, a healthy sports program? Or yeah, I think it's, it's exactly what you just said at the end. It's the healthy sports program. I don't think we're losing students um, playing a different sport instead of playing football. I think, I mean, I can give you just a just a quick breakdown. I have, well, like, it's unfortunate the point you're bringing up, let's cut to the chase. Football costs a lot of money to run, yeah. no matter how you look at it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so um, but given that, given a, but, but yet it brings people together in a lot of ways. And if it's strong, it kind of trickles down to the other programs, I think. Yep. Yeah. That's what I would, I would argue. So just 2021, we had 34 students um, play football, and we had enough for boys and girls soccer and the other programs as well. Um, 2022, we had 50 come out for football, and last year we had 52. Yeah. So, um, and it hasn't hurt any of other athletic programs. That's great. So my, because it's my up other... against boys soccer. I, I think. It's a different athlete, it's a soccer player. Oh player. yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's like soccer. You know, Jeff talks about spring sports. You know, I saw it in the previous school. Uh, you're looking at a baseball or a softball versus lacrosse. That's a more similar athlete. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. Alluding to might be more of an impact in springtime versus the fall. Yeah. yeah. Best lacrosse players are soccer players. My other question is, um, uh, just I want to check in again about the reorganization of the leagues. How, what's your assessment of it now at this point in time? When I hear you say the girls will have a state game for sure, how far are they traveling? You know, well, I don't know that. We usually we travel far because we're, we're going to the states and we're only purely qualifying because we had a 500 season. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're not the top 32. Yeah. So we're getting a play-in game from yeah. everybody that's from 32 on. Yeah. Um, we're probably going to travel quite a way. So. Yeah. It, it does have an impact as far as like travel and probably getting out of school early one day. Um, and um, we are going to take, our team is not huge this year, so we will take the van this year, which cost-wise on a bus won't, won't be crazy. Yeah. So on balance, overall, for, in terms of how it's impacted. Overall, yeah. um, I, my honest opinion, yeah. I, I'm not a huge fan of the state power rankings. Can you say why? Uh, I just feel like... They moved this around, so Mr. Bianca knows because he sits on the wrestling wrestling chair with me. So they talk about, we used to be able to get a vote differential for the states, and now we don't get that anymore. And now that we're moving towards 600 students in the school, 
So the amount of students in the school and then we're not getting the vocational bump anymore, they've actually raised us up in a lot of sports and I've appealed for us to come back down. Yeah. And the MIA so they raised been, you up in, 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 so, uh, in hardness of league. Yes. In, uh, essentially. And it's not, it's not really, it's, part it's, of it is, well, if it's not our league play. It's the playoff part of it that we really take a hit. There's a, the MIA has a, an equity formula where they look at the potential number of students that would actually be athletes. Okay. So vocational, we used to, again, back to the seniors leaving data and others. Yeah, yeah. So what they do is they look at your actual number of males or females, uh, and they guess based on different factors, right. like I low mean, income or uh, dem other demographics. Um, to try to identify how many, what percentage of them are likely to be athletes, and they have data that backs up the formula. What what ends up happening, we is that the vocational schools used to automatically get uh, dropped a yeah, level, yeah, yeah. and they they took away the automatic drop, uh, and then they because they've changed the formula, um, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily reflect the number of people that we have at Smith that are actually going to participate in athletics. So then so translates to, to our needs. Correct. To what we can field. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. I had um, two kids with different experiences. My daughter, this her athletic experience like launched her career as a collegiate athlete, really. Yeah. My son, I mean, the athletic programs, I, I can't speak highly enough here in terms of my own kids' experiences. Right. My son, once mm -hmm. he went out on co-op, um, he loved his soccer coach. He loved his soccer team. I, I couldn't get him back here. Like he was, he was just out working, and you know he's he's out for that whole week. Yeah. So even though he's not far from school, he's not even showing up on campus. And so to make that shift mentally to leave his job or home or wherever and come back to school for sport was was too much for him. Yeah. And then well, the I think the, you know coming from right. sixty different communities, how are they getting home after practice or after games? Who's coming to pick them up? How long? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Just, just yeah, the all parents, the logistics. The parents do come and you know they make a sacrifice when their kids play because yeah. we don't have a late bus. You know, some kids are an hour away, or, or plus more than that, so, yeah. and the right. parents come and pick them up. That's great, great info, John. So, um, there's got more to go. For, uh, so, as far as co-op, just to go over co-op, um, currently, in the 12th grade class, it's 128 um, students in the class. Right now, we currently have 41.5% of our kids out at work. So I can kind of give you a breakdown. 41.5. And I'm going to give this to uh, Ms. Carver so she can have the information after. Um, just to give you a breakdown, so uh, in our senior class, in plumbing, there are nine students out. Carpentry, there are four. Electrical, there are seven. Horticulture, four. Animal science, seven, which is very high this year. Automotive, three. Criminal justice, six. Advanced manufacturing, two. Agricultural mechanics, high also, six. Health assisting, three. Cabinet making, one. Colony arts, one. For a total of 53 students on co-op. That's a senior class. There'll be a few more that will go out, but it'll be very sporadic at this point for seniors to go out. That um, diagram that was in the latest newsletter that I know you yep. both worked on, and it's been, uh, I, I find that so helpful. It's like the, basically the decision tree kind of, you know, if you if this and this and this. Um, what has been the feedback in the school community on that? Have you gotten any? Has it is the process clearer to students and families? Do you think? Or yeah, it's been a lot clearer this year than it's been in the past with that diagram, yeah. well, for sure. It's, it's a great. Our it's biggest great. thing is we still have a lot of appeals, which I'll talk about with the eleventh graders. But um, the diagram definitely does help. And our eleventh grade students uh, currently they were just able to go out uh, right around Martin Luther King Day. Um, so we finally met with kids and we, they got them placed. Right now, there are currently 11 students out. There are eight more going out the week after we get back. And then me and Mr. Bianca have been sitting through appeals. And there's probably another eight to ten that will go out right after try two. So that, you know, and they're just starting to go out. So 
Uh, currently in 11th grade, there's six plumbing students out. Electrical has two. Ag mechanics again, two. So that's your 11 that are out right now. What would you say are uh, the main reasons why students are not eligible and have to appeal? Well, it's a little combination of both. So to make a student eligible, um, academically, they have to have a 75 in their academics in, a, in related, in shop, they have to have an 80. Mm -hmm. So it's either some, some of the kids that we've heard, when we ask them to do appeal, we don't ask students that get 60s to appeal because we're probably not going to let them go out until the trimester's over. Mm -hmm. um, usually it's a couple points in grades. You know, we, we, we can be a little lenient with that as long as the teacher sh will let us know that the kids have showed improvement, they're staying after school, they're working, redoing tests. Um, then we give them the, our blessing to go out, and hopefully they keep everybody, keeps them motivated to go out. Um, and then it's attendance. A lot of it's attendance. So we've been seeing a lot of it this year. It's the first period teacher charties. That's really, kids don't really know that's a thing. And the biggest part of it is the GCC building. The, comp the kids are complaining. They're waiting for the bell to ring, which they shouldn't be doing that. They should be heading to class ahead of time. So when the, by the time they leave the parking lot and they walk all around down back, they're a minute or two minutes late, they get a teacher tardy, and a lot of them did not realize that that affects them for, um, for co-op. So that, that's our biggest offender, I think, right now, um, is the teacher tardies and, and, and attendance. So they can only have five days absent and a five days of dismissals and tardies. That's a combination. And I do want to say that <clears throat> if students are on the line and we have them go out or if they're already out and they start to see a little bit of a slide, so we have a progress report system that Jeff issues weekly. So the students have to go and get it signed off. They have to connect with their teachers uh, so that he can track them on a weekly basis. They have to hand that in. He can see where they are with their grades, if they've been staying after, what extra efforts they've been making. That'll either maintain them out. Um, if it gets to the point, then you know Jeff and I will talk and uh, we may bring them back for a week or two weeks until they get themselves back on track, and then Jeff will release them again. Especially their core classes, English, math, social studies, they need credits and graduate. Then we just pull them back. So. And Jeff has open communication with all the employers, so uh, between him and the department, he's able to handle that. Yeah, and the employer's been great. Um, you're seeing a lot of the ag kids, and I, I don't know how the... DLT thing resonated here where they're coming in and working with the kids but we have a lot of towns that are hiring kids now and they're grabbing the Ag Met kids that's the kid they want because that's the jack of all trades that can pretty much do a lot of different things for them we, we have kids and we have Grammys. You brought, hold on Jeff, Go you ahead. brought up a good point about the DOT they were out here doing projects with yep. the kids and I, I was wondering how that developed too. Yeah, it is and then I start. I was here one day. I talked to the guy, and he says it's like a union thing. He said, "Well, you know, kind of. We're part of Mass DOT, blah." Yeah. I said, "What? What are you doing? You're doing the projects with the kids. Get them exposed yeah. and see what see what." It, yeah, it's a partnership with Iuna. Yeah, Iuna. There yeah. you go. Yeah, I mean, right. we, we got kids in the deal. The, the DPW in Chickamy. We have a DPW in Hadley. We have a DPW in Granby. Um, they're, they're just all over the place. They're grabbing those kids and they, and they love them. And a good thing for those kids is if they go out and they stay there, they're going to train them to get their CDL license. And yeah, they're going they, they to cost them a penny. A town job of some I mean, that's, that's like a five, six thousand dollar value for a student to get their CDL for the town. They may even get a hoisting license. Yeah, yeah maybe. <laughs> Someday. And our kids are all over the place. We have, we have students from out in Dalton that are at, you know, in Alfal that are at Sterrett. And then I went all the way out to... Sterrett. Um, out to past Worcester, um, we had a kid out there that went to a landscaping place. So they, they're all over the place. They, they covered a whole spectrum of our area. How many employers are you dealing with, Jeff? Wow, that's hard for me to, there's a lot of new ones. Well, you got 15 shops, right? So yeah. Just a couple, I, there's a lot. A I, don't, I don't know. I never had them up. So me and Mr. Bianca are working on right now. We've been talking about it, and it's finally going to come, uh, come to light this year. We want to give our, what we call them, partners now. I call them sponsors, but you know how you go in and you see a proud sponsor of a, a certain company? So we're gonna, we're creating a Smith Vocational with a new logo, and we're thanking companies 
for being a proud, you know, proud partner for cooperative education at Smith Oak, and we're going to give them a little acrylic thing all engraved, and we're going to put their name on it. So I'll have a better idea when I really start diving into that. Mm -hmm. um, but there's got to be well, 80 to 85, maybe 90 companies that we deal with, yeah. and it's grown over the last few years yeah. immensely. Can we get them on our sign out front? Well, right now the. Majority of them are on the banner in the cafeteria. In the cafeteria. The electronic sign out front. So oh, I'll just start scrolling them. Yeah. Just scroll them. Yeah, That's well, a great idea. That, you know. Love it. So I, I really will have better number when I start trying to just put say, all that together because you know we want to give them out this year. So. Part, partners with Smith. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. Great job. Yeah. No, oh, that's great. Yeah. Idea. So it's it's been really good. So that's all I have, and unless anybody has any more questions, just. I commend you for being able to get that number of partners to be to. Yeah, and it's not just me. I, I mean, I can't take all the credit. I run around, I check all these sites, but the department heads, they have a lot of contacts. They reach out to people, and it's the DOT. You know, that that's like seven new openings for us um, that we've never had by them coming here and working with our kids, and they, they love the kids. They say they're high, high energy. They want to do everything that they're talking about because it's different things that they don't normally would do here. They don't usually get a chance to pour concrete and you know and the kids get excited about some of that so you know it's that avenue's opened up for us criminal justice now a lot of those are are um, apprentice you know apprentice jobs but they're turning into because you got to be 18 so they're hiring these kids after they turn 18 so they're turning into paid positions uh it's been good i'm part of the policy group on trades women's issues um regular meetings and the big challenge is uh, the pipeline from vocational yeah. schools to the workforce, especially in terms of yeah. diversity, right, with women and... Unfortunately, and we don't have enough kids to send them. There's people that call and they want kids, but and we just don't have enough. To hear that interest is fantastic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That means it's working. You know, that yep. means that the reaching down into the vocational schools is, yep. is serving them. Yeah. I mean, I if more kids were that. eligible to go, they would, they would go out. There's just people calling all the time. That's awesome. So, I want to second Superintendent Bonner's praise of you that you're doing a great job. We've been you. here a long time. It's not just me, though. There's other no, people I that know, help. But you've watched this program grow. So, yeah, it's grown a lot. Me and Mr. Bianco are talking about lot. it today. But you're doing dual duty here, yep. and I, I appreciate the effort. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Board. So, uh, being the month of February, sort of our tradition has been uh, at the faculty meeting in February, typically give what we call the state of the school uh, address, sort of a play on the state of the union address, state of the state. And it just gives us a chance to, to reflect uh, as a school community who we are, uh, the students that we serve, uh, revisit the vision in the direction that we're heading, and then it sort of aligns ourselves to the budget season, which uh, you know, next month will be the big month uh, at the March uh, Board meeting will be prepared to present a budget for next year. Um, if we have a, a tuition rate at that point or not, we, we don't know yet, so it may spill into April. But uh, we feel this particular presentation is a, a, a good uh, prelude into budget season to, to give us a, a chance to review who we are as a school, the direction we're going, some of the headwinds that we're, we're dealing with as a school, uh, and obviously open up any conversation or questions from the board so we're more prepared when we start talking about the numbers next month. So with that said, uh, again, this presentation could be shared with, with any audience, so we want to make sure that we identify who the trustees are, uh, the school administration, uh, the mission statement uh, that we, we read every, every board meeting. And then this particular slide, uh, Dr. Spencer Robinson and I shared this with uh, Senator Comerford a couple weeks ago, and I think it's a great representation of the sending communities. You know, when we talk about you know, the four counties, even the five counties, you know, when I tell people that, you know, we have students from basically the New York border, the Vermont and New Hampshire border, the Connecticut border, and out east of, of Worcester, uh, this diagram verifies that for the most part. Uh, so, as you can see, that green is, is the city of Northampton, and then, you know, it sort of spreads out in all directions. So, as Jeff was saying, we have uh, co-op placements everywhere, you know, our students are living everywhere. And, uh, you know, that one yellow in the, in the east, that's Sterling. And I share this with people that you don't see this on this particular map, but that student or students from Sterling to get to Northampton, uh, the quad is in the way. 
Yeah, so when we talk about a, a commute, you know, an hour plus uh, is truly an hour plus uh, when you have you know, a large body of water in the way. So, anyways, uh, I think it's a great reference to share with people. Student demographics, the next few slides is data from our SIMS data, which is uh, reported to the Department of Ed. Um, so you'll see the school data, and then I, I do a comparison from the previous year, and then also the state uh, demographics as well. Uh, this particular slide is looking at our, our gender breakdown. There's really not a whole lot difference from last school year to this school year, not a whole lot of change there. Uh, the non-binary students uh, definitely went up in the percentage. You know, we added two more students, we're up to eight. Um, but again, only eight students overall. Uh, but for the most part, pretty status quo from one year to the next. This particular slide is race and ethnicity. And again, nothing major changing within Smith Vocational uh, with any of our racial or ethnic groups. Uh, kind, of, kind of status quo again from, from one year to the next. The select populations, I, I do like to highlight this uh, when I talk to the state. And I, I believe five of the, the highest percentage of students with special, uh, who have special needs, who have an IEP, uh, the five districts in the state are vocational schools. And we happen to be one of them. Uh, so as you can see, students with disabilities uh, this year were at 37.6%. That's slightly down from the previous year. Uh, you see the state average is, is 20%. Uh, and then uh, the high needs were 61.5% high needs. Uh, the state average is 55, almost 56 percent. And you can also look at our, our first language, it's not English, and our ELL population. Uh, pretty status quo from the previous year. Now, obviously those two are, are lower than the state average, uh, but when we start comparing ourselves to the other Western Mass CTE schools, you're going to see that we really jump out. Uh, when I share this slide with the, with the staff, and, and we start connecting the dots between who we are, okay, the students that we serve, and potential budget implications, I think this slide jumps out. You know, I asked the question to the staff. So when you see that we have 37.6% of our students have an IEP, what does that mean when it comes to budget season? Uh, you know, what do we have to do for special ed staff, uh, testing requirements, uh, so on and so forth. So, you know, and that is a need that we have here at Smith that not all districts have. So I, I just point that out. Can I ask a question? Of course. Um, I'm noticing in all four of those categories that the percentage, even though it's small, has, has declined. And I'm wondering if you have um, any thoughts about that. Is it statistically insignificant, would you say, or is it a, a trend? Yeah, we talked about it as a leadership team. I, I asked Rebecca, and she, she said she'd have to drill into it. There's really nothing that really jumped out uh, that really identified why we were going down just over 2%. Um, it could be just one year. I don't know. Moving on to uh, the last, the class of 23, their postgrad plans, and again, I think this is a data point when it comes to programming here at Smith. Sometimes this could drive decisions uh, that obviously have a budget implication, and uh, again, this is just a snapshot. This is just the one graduating class, but I do want to point out the four-year public college track. You know, it was an increase of 9% from the previous year, so that's telling me that more students, more graduates are, are trying to pursue a four-year uh, college degree. Uh, beyond that, uh, not a whole lot of change uh, if you look at the other options. But again, so as a school, if we're looking at budgeting and, and programming, uh, if, if this becomes a trend, if we have more students who are truly pursuing post-secondary options, then what are we doing specifically on the academic side to make sure the students are prepared? You know, one of our mottos is, you know, we're in the door business. You know, our, our job is to open up any door that that graduate wants to have open. Uh, so if we have more students wishing to pursue college options, then what are we doing with the budget to make sure that we offer the program that's required for those students to go off to college? So some of the state statistics amaze me. A third, basically a third of the vocational students are going on to a four-year public college. No. So the state is overall all all. Not yeah, 31% of not, all? Not vocational students, of, of all. Of all. Yep. Yeah. Um, I, maybe I'm re reading too much into this, but it, like this, that trend of students um, heading to four-year colleges, and public colleges, and then the decline or the decrease a little bit in the other, it sort of it um, makes me think of the vocational admissions issue, and I'm wondering if it's 
finally making its way out here a little bit, or if this is just an anomaly. That's in that's in my mind though for sure because okay. I don't think it's I I don't think I haven't included our school in that discussion in my head, but that that that's a big that's I I follow nine percent increase, you know. Something interesting to look into. Yeah. 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 No, I, I agree. So as I mentioned, you know, I, I do this annual comparison uh, between Smith and then uh, the three comparisons I use are, are the, the other Western Mass ETE schools. So that's Franklin Tech, McCann Tech, and Pathfinder. Uh, I know it's probably pretty difficult to read up on the screen if, if you have probably access to the handouts. Um, so just a couple of things I want to point out, and, and it'll be a, a further discussion in the presentation. Uh, so underneath each of the school names, you see a number in parentheses. Uh, that's the approximate number of member districts or sending communities uh, for those particular schools. Obviously, here at Smith, we don't have really a, we don't have a regional agreement, so we don't have any member districts. So the 64 is the approximate number of communities that send students to us. Uh, and then you look under Franklin Tech, there's 19 member districts. McCann Tech has nine, and Pathfinder has nine. Below that is the number of Chapter 74 programs that they offer in that particular school, so we offer 15, Franklin Tech offers 14, McCann Tech offers 9, and Pathfinder offers 16. So that's going to give you sort of a framework when we start talking about enrollment and capacity. Then you can see all the demographics I just shared with the previous slides. Uh, it, it's sort of on this one general slide comparing us to them. And the red font is just highlighting uh, that particular school that is the most Diverse typically has the highest percentage. The only exception would be the white students. Uh, that would be uh, the lowest percentage out of those schools. So from my evaluating the data, I would say if you see more red for a particular school, that means that particular school is more, di more diverse. And of the nine, I think it's 14 variables, 14 demographics, nine of the 14 Smith vocational is the most diverse. I tell this to the staff. Uh, it typically you know, results in a round of applause. You know, this is something for us to really hang our head on and celebrate, that we have a very diverse population here at Smith that we serve, uh, which is great. Uh, you know, I, I, I love that fact. If you sort of focus in on the right, though, uh, those last four columns, and that was from the previous slide, that's our first language is not English, our ELL population, students with disabilities population, and our, and our high needs population, we have the highest percentage out of all uh, out of these schools in all four of those. Uh, so again, when it comes to budgeting, we have to focus more money uh, in our ELL uh, program, in our uh, uh, special ed program, and overall our, our high needs. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind as we build in a budget versus some of our counterparts in Western Mass. <clears throat> I'm assuming that um, the probably the number one um, first language of students here that it's not English, it's Spanish. How many other languages do you want to talk about? Um, are, are there other significant lang language groups, or is that really? I think that's the phenomenon. Okay. Okay. Now, I share this slide. I think this is something to celebrate. It, it looks like in a, in a snapshot, in a, in a quick glance, that we are the most, most diverse. Some people, if you look at this data, may say we may have the largest percentage of struggling students. That would be a, a a conclusion or an assumption that people could make when they look at this particular data. <clears throat> By moving to the next slide, okay, this is looking at dropout rate, graduation rates, attendance rates, and, and the accountability percentile. You can see that we're not really struggling when it comes to the other Western Mass vocational schools. Okay, dropout rate, we're right there in the mix. Okay, we're at a 1.5% dropout rate. Uh, the best percentage was 1%, so I, I would say we're within that. Uh, the realm of uh, being competitive with the dropout rate. Graduation rate, this is something we really need to celebrate. We have the highest graduation rate amongst the Western Mass vocational schools. So again, previous slide looks like, you know, we would assume that we may have some struggling students, yet they are graduating at a higher rate than any of the other vocational schools in Western Mass. The attendance rate, the highest was 93.9, we are 93.6. Pretty darn close. Okay, so again, I would celebrate the attendance rate. In an accountability percentile, and again, I, is this something I want to celebrate necessarily that we're in the 28th percentile? Uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, but as a reminder, that is the percentile for all grade 9 through 12 high schools in the state of Massachusetts. We're in the 28th percentile, which flip around means 72% of, of the high schools that have grade spans of 9 through 12 uh, have a higher accountability measure. Okay, so typically mostly NCAS and, and some of the other variables. 
and we're only focusing on the Western Mass Vocational Schools though, we're actually second amongst the vocational schools, uh, just behind the 31st percentile of the Cane Tech. Uh, so again, uh, depending on how you want to look at it, okay, I, I would say that we're doing pretty good when we look at our counterparts in Western Mass. I'm wondering if um, the attendance rates for all of the vocational schools are, are fantastic. And I'm wondering if any of the administrators in the room happen to know what the state average is, since this is such a focus for the soon-to-be former commissioner of education. But um, are are, the, are our attendance rates higher than the state average? Yes. The state? yes. Do, you know, do you happen to know? I don't know the state average, but uh, the commissioner actually, uh, the commissioner and the secretary of education. He did. Uh, he shouted out vocational schools correct. for attendance. Yeah. yeah. It definitely sticks out. Yeah. So now enrollment projections, and this is a slide that we just continually update. And uh, as you know, when we get into the vision, you know, what really the focus of our vision has been to increase our capacity. Uh, so this school year, uh, this is like the latest data, uh, 572 students. You see the breakdown by grade. Uh, and then if you read across the top, uh, the projection for enrollment next year, uh, the 24-25 school year, we are anticipating an additional 22 students. And at that point, we're going to be very close to the, uh, the capacity of 600 students. If you drop down to the bottom left, that would be the following year. Again, an increase of probably only about five students. And then finally, in the 26-27 school year, uh, we're basically at the 600 students. Uh, so my point is, as we begin to get into the budget, you're going to see some of the budget slides in a moment. Uh, we have one more bump. It's a slight bump next year. And then after that, we're going to begin to level out. Uh, just for a point of reference, uh, next year you see those numbers in parentheses. Uh, that is the number of applicants that we have received as of the January board meeting that Joe reports out in his report. So I just want to show the board. Uh, that means the, cur the current applicant pool, okay, next year's freshman. As of January, we had 230 applicants. Last year in January, I'm looking at the sophomores, which were going to be you know, the previous freshman cohort, we had 206 at that same time uh, point of time. The year before that, 172. The year before that, 129. So the conclusion is the interest is growing. Okay? We have more students applying to Smith Vocational by that January benchmark, which again, I think is something to keep in mind as we start looking at budgeting and visioning. You know, our, the interest level continues to grow. Uh, so I'll take that for what it's worth. Uh, but any questions on, on overall enrollment? Again, big conclusion, we're, we're leveling off enrollment, which is going to directly impact budget moving forward. What's your, re oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> What's your retention uh, numbers like? Uh, just looking at this year as one example, okay, so we brought in 150 students typically in the last few years. So the sophomores are only down one, uh, the juniors are only down five. Uh, the seniors, I, th I forget what the explanation of the senior class only being at 128, but uh, we lose a few students. However, we're able, especially sophomore, we're able to bring in new sophomores to sort of refill those slots. But, uh, not a huge turnover, honestly. Thank you, Julie. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we are leveling off because of capacity issues on the academic side, right? Um, what... Um, I don't know if you're able to do this, but I'm wondering, you know, projecting out our ultimate capacity if we were to, if we were to grow the school, recognizing that we're in a region looking at declining student enrollment overall, what, what's your sense of where we're headed? Region-wide overall so, students? Or? Like, if I'm doing the math here, if I, if I did the math right, for, if we get 230 students, every year applying and we accept every single one of them, then, then yeah, we're meeting the capacity. Is that sustainable? That's a different way to ask the question. No. Right. Just to clarify, again, that applicant pool is by January. So by the end of the season, we're probably going to be closer to 300 applications. Yeah. Uh, and right now, the admissions policy is only allowing us to take 150. Right. Uh, so the question is, could we sustain it if we decided as a board to, to change the admissions policy and accept up to the 60 or the 70 or the 80 and pick a number. Right. Could we sustain that long term? Yeah. Um, I think we could. Uh, the problem is going to be as the, the enrollment goes down in the setting communities, yeah. what's going to happen to those setting communities? Yeah. Uh, and that's the big argument that we're having around admission statewide that you know, we see the statewide that the interest is increasing for vocational schools. Our response to the admissions debate is give us more seats. 
build more vocational schools, allow us to expand, we'll take all the students. I don't want to say no to anybody. Um, but in reality, if we said no to anybody, and we took every single family who wants to send a child to a vocational school, what happens to the sending communities? They go out of business. Yeah. Uh, and is that what anybody wants? So I, and that's the debate that's happening. That's what happened in Vermont. And they, there are parts of Vermont where, um, where where communities don't have a local school, a local school. and they um, they just get essentially a tuition voucher from the state and they can have their kid go where they I think the state would be inclined to, well, again, outgoing commissioner. Mm -hmm. I, I think he was in favor of regionalizing. You know, that could be a solution, but mm -hmm. I think it's pretty complicated for the same communities to regionalize just the traditional districts. And I know that this, the number of applicants also includes um, students who are considering this as an option. Not not all applicants are 100% committed. Correct. So yeah, again, we'll send out 150 acceptances, and uh, not all of the 150 acceptances are going to accept the acceptance. Uh, so then we continue to go down the list. Uh, so. Thank you. Okay. So now that sort of gives you the, the background of who we are. Okay, our student demographics numbers. Now let's begin to project forward. Move forward. So the vision. And we've been sharing this vision over the last few years. Uh, and I, I haven't found anybody who wants to argue the vision. But we want to be the predominant CTE school in Western Mass. We want to be consistently at capacity uh, in all of our programs while providing that rigorous and relevant educational experience for all students, not some students, but all students. Uh, I think it sounds like a great vision, but what does that truly mean when we start getting into admissions policies and programming? So with that said, uh, Dr. Spencer Robinson, you sort of talked about that capacity question. Okay, and, you know, this slide I, I keep detailing over the last few years and uh, you know, getting some input from the staff. And I just want to again remind the board where we are when it comes to capacity with admissions. Currently, the number one, our current admissions policy, we can take 150 students per grade uh, per year. That's 600 students. As you saw with our enrollment trends, we're going to be hitting that 600 within the next next year or so. Here's a problem though. If we take 600 students, we currently have 15 Chapter 74 programs, you do the math, that would equate to 10 students per shop per grade. We are currently at 9.48. And that slide that has the comparison data you know, with the other vocational schools, if you do the math, we're at 9.48. That is the lowest average per grade per shop amongst the Western Mass vocational schools. Uh, my point is, we are already setting our shops up for failure when we hold them accountable to try to fill their shops through exploratory. We don't have enough students to fill all of the 15 shops. And when it comes to a budgeting uh, perspective, uh, we probably can't sustain that forever and ever and ever. Uh, and you're going to see that in, in later slides. Okay, with escalating costs, how do we manage 15 shops if we don't have enough students? But that's the current policy. As a board, if our vision is to maintain all 15 Chapter 74 programs, what would it take to fill all of them? Back to sort of what you were alluding to with your question. Uh, well, our capacity, typically in most of the shops, is 12 students per grade per shop. So if we maintain that, that would equate to 720 students that we need to have on campus. That's an additional 120 students beyond what we're going to have momentarily. That's 180 students per grade. Now the question is, do we have enough applicants to fill 180 slides every year, I would argue that we probably do. Okay. Uh, would we end up having you know the, the number 175 to 180, you know the the lower end of the of the criteria? Now, would those students come in with uh, lower levels of prior success? Most likely. Um, but then again, back to budgeting, we'd have to make sure that we had the, the services and safety nets in place to to educate all students. Uh, so there could be a budget impact there. I do think we would have enough of an applicant pool to fill 180 students per grade. Um, so you're still going to maintain that 12, 12 student per shop number, right? At this point, so, all right. Somebody comes in for electrical plumbing. They don't make that shop. Do you really see them jumping to one of the other shops? We we have students who end up in their third or third, sometimes even fourth shop. And then you must. If you lose some, where did those, those students go? Say, well, I didn't get in here, I didn't get my first choice, whatever, I don't want any of the others. Yep. Very few students will leave Smith Vocational if they don't get into a shop. Uh, we'll lose more, back to Dr. Bonner's question, we'll lose more students due to uh, residency issues. Okay? They mm -hmm. live in a particular community where they can only have particular shops here. If yeah, they don't yeah, get into yeah, those yeah. particular shops, the superintendent says, I'm not going to approve a new shop in their own. 
That happens more often than the family choosing not to stay here because they get into a shop. Okay. Yeah, the flip side of that, if I'm just using a projection, if all of a sudden within the, the year that you talked about, East Stam decides to not go the route that they're going and they put their students here, that changes the dynamics overnight. And something like that could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've worked with East Stam very hard to try to change their happen. thinking uh, to make that happen. I spoke with Mary over the weekend from East Stam and she still says that she wants them to come in here, but that she has people in her administration that don't. And the flip side is back to again the, the vision of being at capacity. Uh, if the outcome is, if the decision is 600 students is truly our capacity, you know, we don't we don't want to entertain going above 600 for whatever the reason is. Uh, then what happens? Uh, so 12 students per grade per shop at the current enrollment would equate to 12 and a half shops that we could fill. So my theoretical question I put out there, not that I'm in favor of this, I'm not recommending this, but that means we'd be closing two or three shops. So then what, what two or three shops would we have to end up closing? That becomes another discussion, another debate. Uh, not going to really get into it. We, we know about the admissions policy updates. We have to update them annually now. Uh, you know it's a hot topic across the state about the lottery system. Uh, how that will play into admissions, you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, but any questions around capacity? And this is where we're at with number of students. So visually, uh, this enrollment, uh, this is the last 45 years of enrollment at Smith Vocational. You can see since 2014 or so when Joe and I came here to Smith, we've been increasing enrollment. Uh, the, the red bar represents the non-resident students. I think this is important when it comes to budgeting. Uh, you'll see that the vast majority, again, close to 80% of our students come from outside of Northampton. That really drives the budget, uh, which is the challenge that we have with building a budget, that we don't receive that non-resident tuition rate until late in the budgeting season. So how do we design a budget and propose a budget to you as a board uh, when 80% of our students come from outside of Northampton, yet we don't know the rate. Uh, that's a challenge that we have. And then, uh, again, that theor theoretical question, could we get to 720? I just want to show the board what 720 looks like. You know, we've never been that high, uh, but we have been over 600 back in the early 80s. You know, yeah, the school had over 600 students. So what would that look like? Okay. Uh, now, the flip side is, back in the early 80s, we did not have the number of academic offerings that we have nowadays. Uh, so, you know, it becomes a challenge. Um, you know, back then, you could have your basic math, and you could e easily divide up your students in, in the math, basic math classes, your basic English, English classes, your basic history classes. Now we have a lot of singletons. We're offering advanced placement classes, uh, which is a big push a few years ago. Again, it was a, a request from our, our our families, they want advanced placement courses because a lot of our families wanted to go off to post-secondary. Uh, Spanish and art, again, new introductions that we've had over the last several years. So again, I just want to show the board visually where we're at. <clears throat> Mike, when were you here? Before then. In the 60s. Do you know how many students were here? I don't. Um, I would be, I think it, from my own context, it would be helpful for me to see this with I don't know how we would do this, but the um, number of school-age children or high school-age children, some, some, I, you know, we had the baby boom that meant there were more, right, more mm -hmm. kids going to school, but we're, we don't have those kinds of reproduction rates now. And just so, see, like... Well, with the peak, the peak, it almost coincides with that era. Yeah. So... Because I was, I was a baby boomer. So I would think I had the largest high school class ever. Yeah. 352. Congratulations. So. so how will we get up to that green line? Well, we're increasing. Now, how long have you and, uh, I'm sorry, Andy and Joe been here? We came in 2014. 2014. So basically in that, that low, the most recent low dip is basically when we came. The next slide has not been updated, but it's sort of a placeholder. Uh, this went back to Dr. Spencer Robinson. We were talking about admissions. Okay, um, my last meeting with the state last week. Now they haven't released this particular data yet, uh, but once they do, I'll, I'll update the presentation. Uh, 
So now looking at programming, you know, we've talked about this for the last several years. You know, the vision that we've had here uh, is to really focus on our, our agricultural program. It is sort of the, the flagship program that we have here. Uh, you know, it's in our, our school name. So if it's going to be in our school name, if we're going to stand by, we need to truly become an Aggie. And if you, if you talk to the other three Aggies in the state, and that's Essex North Shore, that's Bristol County, and Norfolk County, they are truly Aggies because they offer all the concentrations that fall under that large umbrella of animal science and, and horticulture and natural resources. If you look at our animal science program, right now, as it stands, we are offering the, the livestock concentration, and we dibble and dabble in some of the other concentrations. Uh, our vision's been to truly offer the state-alone concentrations for our students. Uh, so that would mean offering companion animal. And we've been talking about that over the last couple of years. It would, it would mean looking at veterinary assisting. It would, look like, it would be looking at equine uh, down the road. Uh, All right, well, the first one's coming in line yep. in the next year. Exactly. And where's your, your tracking for veterinarian and equine? We'll get into that. Great segue. Okay. Uh, and, what it, and back to the enrollment capacity issue, uh, you know, we sort of touched on the residency issues. Okay, so students can, depending on where you live, you can come here for only certain programs. The exception to the exploratory regulations is if a student wants to explore in a, an animal science or an agricultural field, uh, they can come here no matter where they live. Uh, so this is the, the natural inclination for us as a school. If you want to focus on enrollment and try to increase enrollment, let's find ways to do that within our agricultural programs because there's no restrictions for the students if they want to come here. And they're only competing with two other schools that are not in that region. Exactly. So, uh, so it, it makes the most logical sense for us to really expand our offerings within the agricultural field. Um, and I sort of detail that here. Uh, horticulture is, is the next one at the state level. Horticulture is very similar to animal science in that they have several concentrations. Uh, the state is beginning to contemplate that they begin to break out some of those concentrations like they're beginning to break out some of the animal science concentrations. Again, that could be a, an opportunity for us moving forward. Now, strategically, as we talk about enrollment, you know, there is that, the big issue at, on, on the table is a new D building, okay, and we have to address that issue at some point, at some, you know, relatively soon, I think. One of the issues when MSBA gets involved in a building project, they look at enrollment and they, they look at projection of enrollment. And if they were looking at our enrollment back 10 years ago at 440 students, we had no need when it came to capacity. We were not at capacity here at Smith. So why would MSBA put us in the pipeline for a new, a new D building? We've had to show, and we're getting close, we are showing the need that we are now beginning to burst at the seams as far as space when it comes to capacity. Uh, to the point where, uh, if we continue to expand in animal science and potentially horticulture, we need more academic classrooms. Well, where are those academic classrooms? We, we don't have any at this point. Uh, and I think if we look at D-building, you could easily redesign D-building uh, to, to offer more academic classrooms. So that's that long-term vision that we've been working towards. You know, we've, we've been so hyper-focused on animal science and the ag programs, but with the eye on the, the ultimate prize, which is a new D-building. How do we make that argument long-term? We're getting there. Do you see the article that um, Lennox is, is going to go it alone without MSBA so that they can build, build in a new school? They're uh, building an addition to an existing school that will get done 10 years sooner. A vote school? school. No. A traditional yeah, school? Yeah, high school. Um, I was pretty intrigued by that. They are the billionaires. <laughs> The, the reality of the, you know, 10 years and they said, you, you know, before MSBA is even going to take it serious, it's going to be years. Yeah. You know, staffing, I just want the board to, to again, remember how far we've come over the last several years. So we've had this vision, we've been working towards that vision, talking to the, working with the staff. We knew that we had to expand <coughs> in staffing. Uh, this is a direct budget implication. We, need, we needed more teachers, and we've been working hard doing that. So academically, you see the teachers that we've added over the last few years. On the vocational side, you see where, where we've been adding. Administratively, you know that we you know, we hired Mr. Clark as the second assistant principal this year. That was key. Uh, you know, moving forward, you know, we're looking at the facilities director, you know, Tim. How many more years he has, we don't know. Um, but right now, he has two full-time jobs. He is the full-time facilities director. He's also the full-time farm manager. There's no way we're going to find a replacement when he retires that can do both of those jobs to his level. Uh, so, you know, we're looking as an administrative team, you know, when that day happens, 
dividing that out. Uh, so we, we have a facilities director, we also have a farm manager. Uh, and then just support staff, knowing the students that we, we uh, educate. What do we have to do to better support our special ed population with such a high percentage? In administrative support, I look at you know, Ms. Fairman and, and her staff. When it comes to billing, as enrollment goes up, and a larger number of students that are non-resident means billing. And that's just one piece of the responsibilities that happen under Ms. Fairman's watch. Uh, there may have to be some more additional support administratively. Facilities, we have not been sitting on our, lap, on our hands doing nothing, you know, just hoping that we find that money to build a new D building, uh, to build a new horticulture building. Uh, I'm not going to go through every single bullet, but it is nice to sit back and revisit this list every once in a while because you, I think we quickly forget, and I'm talking to the staff about this as well, we do quickly forget all of the projects that we've been able to complete over the last few years to make this campus more attractive to students and staff, make it more welcoming, uh, increase uh, sort of our marketing and our branding. Uh, there's been a lot of things that we've been able to accomplish over the last few years. And this is a multi-slide. The list goes on and on. First culinary. Exactly. I, I don't know. Did, did you miss some, Andy? There's several that are missing. And again, at the bottom, you know, this sort of gets into uh, you know the expanded animal science complex that's in progress, a new D building. You know, that's a big sort of governance model type of discussion. How do we make that happen? Uh, whether it's a new D building or just a, a new building in general. You know, there's uh, a camp. There's sort of two separate camps. There's a camp that wants to focus on simply replacing D building. There's also a camp that says, why don't you just knock the whole campus down and build one new building? You know, we could talk about that. Uh, Are those camps on campus or in the community or what, where? Uh, I would say on campus is more the D building camp. Uh, I, I think there's the majority of, I don't want to speak for people, but I think the majority of people on campus enjoy the campus more and they're okay with replacing a building. I think more externally, and if you start talking about about if you start talking to some of the legislators, they may look at uh, one building as, as the answer. Uh, as a reminder, we're looking at school-based health centers someday. Okay, we are going to begin to offer services very quickly. Uh, you know about the horticulture building, the animal control facility. If that happens, okay, or not, we don't know. So I just want to give some context and an update on the animal science complex. Again, this is sort of that. That front burner, okay, how do we expand enrollment, how do we get to capacity and, and truly uh, realize our vision. We know that the new animal science complex consists of the former GCC building uh, that was completed last spring. Uh, you heard sort of uh, an indirect consequence, okay, when students lag behind in the morning to get down there, they're not late. Uh, but you see that's, that's providing us two classrooms, a locker room, and instructor space. The MS barn, um, you know, we worked, we began this last spring, um, and it's going to be uh, a pocket pet lab for, com for the companion animal concentration. We're also going to have a, an egg production facility down there, a new quarantine area, and all of that work also began last spring. The nursery barn was demoed and uh, is, is closing in on, on completion. Uh, our goal is to have that completed by the end of the school year. That's going to be uh, the future home of our dog grooming and boarding area. Uh, will be mixed use, we'll have another classroom option in there. Again, the classroom space is at a premium. So we designed that space in a way that you could have an intake with the dogs in the morning, but that space could also be used as a classroom uh, when necessary. To continue on with this, the animal science complex, the dairy barn, uh, we are uh, hope, hopefully this year, uh, we'll renovate sort of that, that basement elevation uh, to include housing for pigs and other livestock. Yeah, that was one a uh, consequence of demoing the, the previous nursery barn, uh, the pig barn, we lost an area for the pigs. So our goal and our vision is to have the pigs in the dairy barn. The horticulture building, I'll, I'll talk about more in detail uh, coming up. And then the horse barn, back to Mr. Aquadro's question, so what are those next steps? So as we, we complete these previous construction projects, okay, the next goal would be to look at a potential horse barn, like a four stall horse barn down that same complex area. Ideally, down the road, if we're able to demo the existing horticulture building, you know, if we're able to completely uh, complete phase two of the horticulture building, that gives us more area. Uh, but we definitely are thinking about a horse barn down there for any car program. When you shared this with the faculty, uh, um, what, what kind of reception does it get? Uh, is this, are they aware of all, like, 
is just like, yeah, we know. We, we're here working on campus. Um, we see all this work being done. We know what the vision is. Or is it news to folks? Or is there a combination of things? I don't think it's news to them. I think they're fully aware of the vision. Um, my take, and maybe I, I read body language incorrectly, but I think I'm pretty good. Um, they're actually encouraged. They're happy to see that we are moving in a direction. So we didn't get a lot of questions or a lot of... No. No standing ovations. Last year we got a standing ovation over the assistant principal hire, but <laughs> it was still pretty positive this year. Well, you can get a standing ovation over the security of the, of the doors. That was a hot topic. So they were happy with that, yes. Um, yeah, but it truly brings up a good point. It, 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 the staff seen these same slides we're seeing here. Yes. We the presented, same information. We presented this at the yeah, February. Yeah, there's a boatload of work done here. In the, Correct. I think it's important for everyone, to, especially the well, facility absolutely. upgrades, because we forget about what's been you know, updated. Uh, I think it's nice to well, if you step keep back. Well, stakeholders and, involved, they build in ownership of it. Correct. So the horticulture building we build, I just have a few bullets. Um, I know later in your agenda you have a, a vote on DD. Uh, Craig, our OPM is here to give you more context at that point. I just want to give you a quick over, overview. Uh, some good news came to us uh, for, since the last board meeting. Uh, so the current estimate that we're looking at is anywhere from that 5.9, 7.2 million range, okay, give or take. Um, and just as a reminder, it's nice to step back and remember where we were several months ago that it, the original estimate came in at approximately 12 million. So we are more uh, into a more real area of affordability for a new horticulture building. The local market assessment that uh, as a board you, you voted to approve and allow us to go out and get a local market assessment that did come back at just north of 6 million. Uh, that does include soft costs. Uh, so again, that was I, I feel, felt encouraging that uh, we potentially have the revenue sources to accomplish this building project. And who did that? Uh, Western Builders. The available budget, 7.2 million. This is the new figure. Uh, this is the best news that has probably come out over the last month or so. Uh, that's you know we've been hovering around 6 million, and I've been reminding the, the board almost every single meeting, you know, about 6 million. The majority of that was the skills capital grants, along with insurance and so on and so forth. It jumped up to 7.2 because the state, specifically the EEA, uh, came through with 1.2 million towards this particular project. Uh, there's some stipulations we'll get into when, when Craig presents uh, in a little bit, but I just want the board to know that we now have available to us 7.2 million. So again, back to the estimates, it's reassuring to me, to the building committee earlier today, and I would hope you as a, as a board of trustees, I, if, I was, if I was you, I would feel more comfortable where we are tonight moving forward with the building construction. We, we do have the, the money available. Uh, but as a reminder, I have to be sort of the realist of the 7.2 million, 600,000 of that is technically uh, in, in tuition revolving. I've been talking about the shell game from day one, okay? Before the fire, when we were talking about the vision, those previous slides, talking about the animal science expansion, that was our vision went well before the fire. I was prepared to stand in front of you as a board and advocate for 600,000 out of tuition revolving so we could pay for uh, the renovations and, and expansion of the animal science uh, program. Then the fire happened, and the first skills capital grant came out, and my, and my working with Bob LePage at the state, I asked him, could we apply for that first grant, technically for animal science, because we were in the, the midst of that, uh, and he allowed that, knowing we could then, behind the scenes, take the money out of tuition revolving to pay for the horticulture building. It's a shell game. Uh, but my point is, as a, as a board of trustees, and responsible for the overall budget, there is 600,000 out of the 7.2 that is sitting in tuition revolving. And we may, as a board, you may want to consider uh, the long-term sustainability of the school, the operating budget, so on and so forth, uh, that we may want to keep that in the back of our minds uh, before it's done. Are there, um, what, what strings are attached to the EEA funding? Great segment. We'll, we'll talk about that. that. <laughs> yeah, there's an actual, a perfect slide that we'll cover. Yeah, there's a lot of stipulations, but they're worthwhile. And did they sign we, this offer in blood? Um, yes. I don't. In blood? <laughs> well, my blood. Um, <laughs> we need um, more blood. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 it's a great. I, I will talk about this. Yeah. I'll finish this slide. A great point. I, I think you deserve to have that background. Uh, 
4.7 of the 7.2 million is tied up in skills capital grants in the EEA funding. My point is 4.7 million is a there's a deadline to spend it, and that deadline is next June. So that has not changed. So the 1.2 million is not an extension. It, it's staying with that same deadline. Uh, and again, by, by next June. There's two phases. Not, not next. Not the next June of 25. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, June 25. So phase one, uh, and this is what we're focusing on in, in, in your agenda item later, is to vote on DD, which will tackle phase one, which is, is the smaller new facility and is maintaining the existing structure. Uh, I just want the board to be aware, though, as long as we maintain that existing structure, there's some required upgrades and repairs that have to happen. And I've been concerned about where that money was coming from to, to do that. No guarantees, and, and Craig's going to say it much more uh, eloquently than I can, uh, and we won't know the final cost of the new building until we go out to bid. But my point is, I feel comfortable to move forward. If there's a potential to have any money left over, I would advocate as a board that we look at maybe some necessary, necessary repairs in the existing building to make sure we can sustain it for the next few years. Uh, so I just put that out. Phase two <clears throat> is to actually complete the project down the road when we find that money tree. Uh, and, and that phase two is to include the head house, the greenhouse, and the additional classroom. That was all part of the original plan for this particular building. We cut it out when we knew we didn't have enough money. Uh, and once we add those those areas, is then to demo the existing structure, and ideally, you know, that opens up a new canvas. We can look at the equine you know, program, so on and so forth. Uh, I want to put now. Let's talk about the conversation I had with the state uh, back to Dr. Spencer Robinson's question. The 1.2 is earmarked certain stipulations we're going to talk about. Uh, there's no questions. I don't think there's a whole lot of debate or pushback on the particular stipulations. Uh, what's going to happen logistically is the EAA is going to send that 1.2 million over to the Executive Office of Education. They're going to attach the 1.2 million to one of our current skills capital grants, and that's how we're going to access the 1.2 million is through the skills capital grant. So again, as a board, just be cognizant of the fact that that means that's a reimbursable grant. So that 1.2 is not a check to us. That's the Smith vocational, you have to spend the money and then you can get it back. Uh, the second phase, though, uh, this was a big discussion with the, the EEA that same day. Uh, they were really inquiring about what would it take to complete that project, to add in those, those learning areas. And there's some, some building materials that they really were focusing on, they want to invest in, specifically the CLT, uh, which was a building material that we were looking at way back when. We that was our $12 million cost, million dollar budget. It cost way too much money. That was just what, yes, exactly. <laughs> So we cut all of that out. A proposal that they want us to, to think about, uh, and we don't have to, there's no agreement in either direction, but just philosophically, they were asking about the property that we manage, and would we have the appetite to look at a conservation restriction on any of the property? Uh, so I, I explained the different properties that we have, the main campus, the demonstration force up by the VA hospital, and then the state lands. I said, well, obviously the state lands, you already have it. Okay, it's already state property. So we really uh, focused on the demonstration force. Their, kind of their initial proposal is, if we were allowing a conservation restriction to be applied to the 182 acres of the demonstration force, that would equate to money, okay, there would be a monetary value to that, and could we then take that money and then complete phase two? Uh, so uh, I found that very enticing. I shared that with the board just as sort of you know, information to file away. Uh, and when it comes to your vote, later, okay, on, on DD, again, you're really focusing on, do you want a wood building or a metal building? Uh, I would recommend that, you know, you seriously look at the wood building, that way you accept the 1.2 million. If you vote on a metal building, you're giving up the 1.2 million, and it would make it more difficult for us to look at phase two with that potential agreement with the state. If we start with a wood building, it makes that second phase easier to sort of marry the two structures. Why did you caution us about the $600,000 in tuition development money? When we get into he the wants, budget slides, you're going to see. He wants, one um, one so argument was save it for a rainy day, and then the other argument was to spend it on the, the existing horticulture building for now, or some of it. So, I, I want to caution the board of the $600,000. When we get into the budget, and we look at our tuition revolving account, Currently, the balance is 
under a million? Yes. Okay. That account we have, that's where we have to budget the Northampton transportation contract that we have. Uh, that's also sort of that fund that we use for potential capital projects on campus. Our stabilization fund. Yes, our stabilization fund, exactly. So the more we deplete that account, the more at risk we are. Uh, I was standing fully behind the fact of spending that money to get this project done. We have to get this building built. All I'm saying is, if we have the funds available to us through other avenues, that might be an option for the board to say, you know, rather than, here's my point, rather than uh, debating potential alternates, and alternates are basically add-ons to the, the project. Do we want, you know, do we want this option and that option? Think about buying a car, you know, do you want your power windows or not? Okay, that would be an alternate. Uh, so I, I just want to caution the board to say, you, you may have the opportunity as a board to say, Let's hold off on some of those alternates if we have the opportunity to save upwards of the 600000 I don't know if we, if we can save that or not. Uh, I just want the board to be cognizant of the fact that we have a school to run, an overall operating budget to manage, and that might be one area that we could save on. Yeah. We don't have well, can, to can, to can, in but our size. Can, we, can we make that decision after we get the bids in so okay. we know what we're dealing with? Correct. Yep. This was all projections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. How much so. is the um, transportation contract? Um, it's a little less than 200000 a year. Um, mm -hmm. The increase this year, I believe, is 4% from last year. That comes out of our operating budget? That's what we've offered. Who has? And we get the money through the state to help cover that. The tuition revolving account no, no. is because as next month when I stand in front of you and present a budget, we have to estimate how many non-residents yeah, yeah, we yeah. have. So we, we underestimate to ensure that we're going to meet the budget. Uh, and then hopefully, in reality, we get more students than we budgeted. And that so-called <laughs> surplus of students, that the tuition money goes into the tuition revolving account. And per student, we don't. It's yeah. going to be a small percentage. Well, and then it, if we have to. <laughs> <see it>, right. <laughs> Some point, chasing that game, what's going to going to catch up if we max out at 600 students? I'm not going to be able. To You're completing my my presentation for me. You're right. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I didn't even look at the slides ahead of us. Okay. Uh, so again, that's, we can talk more about the horticulture building you know, when we get to that agenda item. In D building, just quickly, I just want people to know this is truly the the big vision. You know, that is the the topic that we have to deal with as a board of trustees at some point. You know, those conversations are begin beginning again. How do we find that path forward? So we yes, how do we find that path? Uh, I said this before, just simply looking at the circumference of the existing building, that building is a U-shaped, a, a horseshoe shape. If you took that same circumference, you just yeah. made it a square, you automatically increase square footage. Uh, you could have two stories, and you're automatically inheriting more academic space. Uh, so here's a crazy idea. Could we sell to the MSBA to cut the existing building and close the horseshoe with the new building and the new... I don't know, maybe... Uh, and then lastly, this is just something that came up actually through the, the presentation to the staff and talking to different stakeholders. You know, are we open to the idea of temporary classrooms? So, you know, we hit 600, we're not at a spot to you know, get to 720, we're not at a spot where a D building is going to be built next year. Uh, in that interim period of time, do we want to begin to entertain such a thing? I'm not saying, I'm not giving you a recommendation, I'm just putting it out there that, again, this is feedback that I get from different stakeholders. Uh, that would allow us to hopefully get beyond the 600, because we'd have more academic space. Uh, it could strengthen the case of, you know, nobody wants to have temporary classrooms, you know, so we definitely need to have a building project. So, again, something to think about. And, and that's feedback that I've received, given this presentation to the, the leadership team and to the faculty. The quadrillion and Saruti put me in a temporary classroom, and it was... <laughs> when it you was, were in JFK? Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and it, and it, was, it was fun. I mean, we built a little community, our, the four of us out there in Siberia. So that, that sort of completes the vision. I want, that hopefully the board can fault. understand. <laughs> you know, that's been the path that we've been working towards over the last few years. I, I hope you can now begin to see. I, the staff is finding it easier now, I feel, that we're getting to 600 students. They can see the realization of, wow, now we've got to 600. Now we can see the animal science complex is now finally coming to fruition. Oh, now I can understand why they've been talking about the enrollment and about D building. So you know, now we're getting to that point yeah, yeah. where hard conversations have to begin. So let's start talking about budget. Uh, I only have a few slides, uh, but just to kind of whet the appetite of what to expect. 
So we talked about non-resident tuition rates. I just went back the last several years. I want the board to see. Uh, you, know, you see the growth, the, the increase in tuition since uh, FY18. Uh, that in annual increase since FY18 has been on the average of 3.09%. Why? Wh what happened in 17 and 18? And that's recession. Wow, that was a recession. I want the board to see this, not to scare anybody. But if I said, you know, that's a possibility that the tuition rate goes down, nobody wants to believe me. Yeah, I was just thinking the same thing. What if it goes down? I put that out there. So in that short span, it's actually going down 2.89% a year. One, two, three, four, five, seven seven years of increase. So it's either going to level or go down. I'd, I'd be, yeah, I'd be surprised if it goes up. But again, we won't know. Things are stabilizing right now. But. Yes. So if you can burn that 3.09% increase into your brain, you're going to see uh, our budget's been increasing at a higher rate than that. Okay, and that's what I really so want. So when, to when will you know the rate? Not soon enough. <laughs> so this this is why uh, this is why we bumped the March meeting back a week, yeah, yeah, yeah. hoping to buy a week. Uh, and even then, we may not have the rate by that point, which oftentimes we don't. I present uh, a draft budget to all of you. We can right. sort of talk about it, and then most likely that means the April meeting will have the, the tuition rate by that point. I don't know off the top of my head. What what were the unit duty percentage increases in the last round of contracts? I can show you the overall. I have a. Um, Is it four four four? Do you know, Kristen? I know um, for FY twenty five, it's three percent. Three. Okay. It was like two and a quarter, two and a half, or I might be reversing those two numbers in the third is three. Plus the the, the the top step. Plus the which is about half of our Superintendent, tell me what factors are in the formula that determines the tuition rate. I think Crystal can help a little bit. Okay, absolutely. Okay. I, okay. So a few years ago, I tried to do it myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I work with Rob O'Donnell. Um, and unfortunately, it's not an easy formula. So there's um, many factors that go into it. And you said some of the numbers that were not So, yeah, uh, it was actually the 16, 17 school year, the first big drop there that you, set, that you see. So I was the principal at the time, Joe was the assistant principal, um, and we had an interim superintendent. And uh, you know, as Joe right now, Joe is going through you know, some long hours with Crystal trying to develop a, a school level budget to present to me. I was in Joe's seat during that, that year. Uh, and we had some major, major cuts that had to happen. Uh, so we were working through how do we cut, how do we cut, how do we cut, how do we cut. And then the interim superintendent came in and said, don't worry about it, we'll just go into the, to the tuition revolving account. We'll balance the budget by going into tuition revolving. Sitting in Joe's seat, I was very happy. I mean, I didn't have to cut anything. Okay? Uh, I then became superintendent, uh, and I, I, I told the, the board at that point, and I'll tell this board, uh, I will not present a budget to the board uh, that require us to, to go into tuition revolving. You just can't do that, do that with your personal budget. I will not do that with the school budget. Um, that's just not sustainable at all. Uh, but that's how we balance the budget. We actually did go into tuition revolving at that point to balance it out. Uh, so. Didn't that happen in Northampton last that's, year? Well, that's, that's part of our issue right now why we have the gap. There were three contributing factors, and that's one of them. We, we went into our school choice. You just can't sustain that long term. So, again, not, not to, I, I, the way I described this to the staff at the faculty meeting, you know, and, and that was on the heels of the mayor's uh, presentation to, to the committees. Uh, 
I said, we're not looking at a fiscal cliff. Okay? I would not call some Smith location at a fiscal cliff scenario. We are at a fiscal wall scenario, okay? uh, which I think we'll talk about momentarily about what that wall is. So this slide, again, I, I said, you know, in bed, you know, that 3.09% increase of tuition revolving over the last several years. This slide looks at the overall percent change in that far right column. So, you know, how are we looking at, you know, a 7%, an 8%, a 5% increase? Uh, the reason why we have a percent increase at a higher rate than the non-resident tuition rate is because our enrollment has been going up. Think about the number of students as like a multiplier. Uh, so as we begin to level off at 600 students, then really the only potential increase that we have with our budget is any potential increase that we have with the non-resident tuition rate, Chapter 70 money, you know, uh, but we know that the Chapter 70 money is such a small percentage of the overall budget. It really is, non-resident tuition rate will drive the bus here. Uh, so I, I, I caution everybody, to, I would not envision overall percent increases of the budget of that high. It would probably be in that three to four percent uh, increase. Our, and our our budget is people primarily, and the with the increased enrollment, we hired more staff. And we can all probably name who, who was in which positions or we saw a previous slide or were added on a previous staff. slide. So once we you know we don't need to increase the, the the hiring of new staff if our enrollment isn't increasing if it's stable, but we do have to keep pace with contract negotiations and um, any other costs that. Are beyond that are outside of staff class. Correct. Which I think is a good, great segue. I think. Yeah, good to go to slide. Slide. So, in column number headwinds, oh, again, so that wall that we're beginning to hit, uh, that wall is sort of our enrollment capacity. Um, so, one major headwind is just construction here on campus uh, between the horticulture building, the campaign animal building. Uh, you know, I, I do worry uh, that we may have to look at the tuition revolving account, and we've been looking at the tuition revolving account to get these projects done. Uh, since this particular slide was created, you know, we got 1.2 million from the state, so I think we are in a better position when it comes to the horticulture building. Uh, but I just want the board to be, again, cognizant of the fact that we have projects that have to be completed one way or the other. Uh, the leveling of the student enrollment, you know, that's going to begin to limit the overall budget growth, and you saw that in the previous slides. I would anticipate anywhere in that three to four, maybe five percent increase. That might be on the high end. Okay, that's what I'm, I'm just projecting out. But some of the the budget lines, you know, and a lot of you have already thrown out some different areas. Um, consumables. As I sat in the department head meetings with Joe and, and Crystal, and I listened to the department heads specifically on the vocational side, you know, as they're presenting their budget requests, consumable after consumable after consumable, they're all talking seven percent increase. Just look at cost of copper and, and whatnot. We heard that at the advisory meeting. As well. Yes, exactly. So, and that's we have to have consumables in front of our students. When we are a vocational school, so it's very difficult to, to cut back on that. Another area you know, we heard this from the mayor. Uh, we heard this from the finance director. We're looking at the GIC. Uh, you know, cost increasing nine to ten percent. So again, something we have to be cognizant of. Utility costs. So. This year's cost over last year uh, were over 12% increase in electricity. The previous year, okay, uh, comparison was just shy of 30% increase. Uh, I shared that, and, and then I sort of, uh, I, I shared this with the staff as well. We know that we're building a companion animal building, and you know, we're building a horticulture building. And right now, the initial uh, design is all electric. Uh, so if the electric, if electricity is going up at this rate, uh, what's going to happen when we have two buildings that are completely electric? Are we going to have solar panels on them? Potentially. The, the horticulture building, the, uh, the roof system will be designed to support solar panels. How quickly we get solar panels on the roof, yeah. we have to discuss that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can, um, can you give us an idea of, the rather than a percent, the dollar figure for the consumables and the GIC? The GIC? Yeah. So, so that was presented the at the last, uh, the GIC had, had a um, meeting with all the members. They right. invited people, and that's when they were talking about the increase in costs. So what's the, what is the dollar cost? Because so, I know that, um, you know, like, so, so looking at those percents, there's not a big difference between seven and nine, but if consumables are 
you know, 100,000 and GIC is 100 million because of the number of people. Like, what, do you know what those? They didn't give us a firm number and then they said within the next few months they would, you know, obviously finalize the prices. We'll have the prices for the GIC um, early, late March. Um, and at that point, we'll know what the dollar amount is. Yes. What, are, what are they now? Do you know? I don't. It depends on each. Um, so all of the HMOs, the city um, contributes 8% where the employee pays 20 yeah. and PPO is 50 and 50. Yeah. So I, unfortunately, I don't. So it, it depends. Okay. Yeah. If it's single or yeah. Yeah. Okay. married or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I have to. And on consumables, right out. Um, it's another tough dollar amount because our shops uh, have such great partnerships. Yeah. And we get a lot of consumables don't we? Don't we? Yeah. But we spend, we allocate about $150,000, I would say. Okay. Uh, as I'm doing the math in my head, somewhere in that range, yeah. plus or minus. You. So you're probably looking at twelve dollars to $15,000 increase. Mm -hmm. Um, Dr. Lincoln Hooker, next month, could you please have for us what um, either last year or this current year, what the costs were in, in, I mean, I'd be most interested in consumables, the GIC, I guess those four that you put, right? Okay. The consumables, GIC, utility costs, and contractual interest. You and want dollar amounts. Dollar amounts of what was actually spent. Mm -hmm. So then I can do the math in my head, sort of just say like, okay. Cause just because I know those numbers are going to be very different. Correct. Like a, whatever, that number for principal is going to be a GIC number. I think, uh, just because yes. of the number mm -hmm. of employees and the, mm -hmm. what health insurance costs. Right. No, no definitely. What plans they have. And what plans they have, right. It, contractual increases, you know, we're anticipating about a 4.9% increase uh, in the proposed budget. Just to, again, talking about increased staffing and stipends and so on and so forth over the last few years. The previous year, we had a, a pretty large increase of 11.9%. That was probably contractual uh, negotiations, but also in increasing staff. Uh, so that's why we decided to be up there. And again, I, I just I put this out here. This is why I'm saying it's a fiscal wall, not a fiscal cliff. And this is why I'm talking about how can we be sustainable long term, maintaining 15 shops at 600 students. Just hypothetically, just play the game with me for one second. If we added 120 students, that's 96 non-resident students, that's about approximately 80% of our student body, at the current non-resident tuition rate, that's 1.9 million extra in the operating budget. Then we add some additional Northampton students, which means some additional Chapter 70 money, that would be money on top of that. Uh, so my point is, I said this to the staff a few years ago, you know, as I projected out, let's get to 600, and, and a lot of the staff got scared, you know, can we maintain 600, can we educate 600 students? We're educating 600 students. But what can we do with another $1.9 million, okay? Uh, and, and I would talk to Joe a little bit. Increasing our enrollment by 120 students sounds like a lot of students. But when it comes to staffing, back to your, your question a little while ago, Dr. Spencer Robinson, I don't think it would require a whole lot of additional staff necessarily because you're looking at 120 students divided across the four grades that's 30 30 students per grade uh, when you build an academic schedule with 30 additional students they're spread out across different sections within each period uh, so you know what is that class size going up in reality uh, it may be less of an impact on the academic schedule than some people forecast uh, and I could easily see 1.9 million going very easily to support uh, the programs that we have. And then you wouldn't have cut departments, you could fill the departments. Correct. So I just put that out there again, back to vision. I would love to see yeah, that in the budget. It would definitely help. Uh, with that said, I'll, I'll turn it over to the board. Is there a budget $14 million now? Yeah. Okay. I'm second chair. Oh. So, with one of Joe's report? Yes, sir. Um, good evening, everyone. So enrollment is 572 students currently. You can see the applications year over year. So we're at 267, so we're up about 14, I'm sorry, 24 from where we were uh, this time in 2023, about 19.9% .9 from Northampton. Uh, below that, our school and district report card. Uh, those announcement letters were sent out on February 9th, and it's been posted on our website. Uh, that was sent out in English and Spanish. 
Highlights, uh, as Dr. Lincoln-Oper said, we are 28th percentile, which is a plus 2% increase. We're at 26 prior. Uh, something we are proud of, 53% progress towards improvement goals, our targets there. 98.3% of our teachers are licensed in their field of study, 100% are licensed through the waiver process. Uh, we're 6% higher than state average. Ninth grade passing rate is 10.1% above the state average. Uh, Four-year graduation rate, as you saw earlier, Dr. Lincoln Hooker's slide, 94.8. That's 4.7 above state average. Um, just some key highlights: we decreased from 12 to 8 in the students not meeting expectations category in biology, uh, decreased from 11 to 2 in physics, and decreased from 8 to 4 in math. We did go up a little bit in English, but we did increase in the other categories. Uh, one of the things I definitely want to highlight is physics. We've been working hard with Mr. Roy, our physics instructor. Um, he's made some changes to revamp curriculum uh, and really been digging into the data over the last few years on uh, what concepts the students are struggling with and finding ways to use a lot more project-based, a lot more hands-on activities uh, that I think are in the wheelhouse of our students. Um, absenteeism was discussed before. Uh, we did get four out of four points in chronic absenteeism because we had such an improvement. But I do want to caution the board, as you remember, as we close those gaps, it's harder to get points the following year. Um, so, you know, next year we may get one out of four or zero out of four. It doesn't necessarily mean, it really just means that we stay the same or uh, on average, which we did in other categories uh, that I didn't highlight here. We got zero out of four, uh, but really we just remain at the... Uh, gap that we were at. So we didn't make a sizable improvement. Um, budget, so Ms. Fairman and I are working yeah. on that budget proposal for Dr. Lincoln Hoker. We're on track to get that to you all. On the back, we're still trying to uh, post for long-term substitute in the health assisting, and we did repost for the health assisting instructor. Um, we did have, we have one candidate that has applied now, and this is the third posting uh, that, that we've done. Um, so that's our struggles right now around personnel. So, any of your questions? That's my report. I, I just want to highlight that, that one candidate for the health assisting position. Back to budget, I know budget is sort of on the front burner and, and contract negotiations and whatnot, and the impact the contract negotiations have on budget. But if we don't have staff in front of our students, we don't have a school. And in this particular case, the last cycle of unity negotiations, we actually dropped the requirement. If you look at the pay scale, uh, historically it was you have your columns for your, your college degree. But on the vocational side, if you had a master's degree, but you had a, a preliminary license or you were on a waiver, you weren't eligible to be in a master's column. You were stuck in that first column until you earned your professional license. Uh, and we lost a lot of candidates for that uh, because of that. The last round, we, we dropped that requirement. We agreed uh, with UNID. Yeah, this particular candidate that is looking at the health assisting position, uh, the candidate has a master's degree. So it's really opened up the door for the possibility of hiring somebody in a much needed position because of a decision uh, that the board made, which was great. So it may cost the school more money, but we have to spend money to, to get these teachers in front of them. So I just want to highlight the fact. Thank the board. Uh, but again, it's a budget impact that negatively impacts the budget. But we had to do that in order to have the staff in front of our students. So thank you to the board again. Joe, congratulations on your percentile rank. Congratulations on the number of teachers license. Fantastic. Um, congratulations on ninth graders passing. Great. Love the correlation with staying through and graduating. Um, Congratulations on the graduation rate and on the um, moving students out of the not meeting expectations category in all of those subjects. Um, I, I hate, I don't like the zero sum game of the ranking the state does, like you said, you know, you can improve one year and then it works against you the next year, you know. Um, when you said English uh, students maybe dropped a little bit, didn't perform as well, my mind went right to, Oh, you know, what's the difference with biology, physics, math, and English? I'm like, oh, written word, sustaining focus, cell phones interfering with that. And so um, that my question to you is, is there interest 
on campus at all, either on the academic side or the vocational side, or both in, um, in banning cell phones campus-wide. I think there's some limitations classroom by classroom. Yeah, I, I think there's some, there's some interest. Um, the way that we've always kind of discussed it with the faculty and staff, and I think this is the more overwhelming philosophy on campus, is uh, that we're trying to teach career skills. And part of that is understanding that what's involved in one area in your life isn't necessarily allowed the other, and trying to handle things educationally. The academic teachers have done a really good job um, bringing forward proposals of trying to get themselves all on the same page. Uh, and how they're going to handle things within every apartment and with every classroom. They're mostly all in C building, right? One mostly all in C building. Yeah. Um, even then, you know, they're, they don't have 100% consensus. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is following the policies that they've adopted they and we've supported fully. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we try to come at it from that, the viewpoint of we would rather educate the students than not. Um, and just take it away and say that's it. On the brain science, I hope. I mean, there's just more and more research that supports the damage it does, the dopamine yep. hits, the, you know. Yeah, so, so we're, we're in favor of limiting it, and we're in favor of, of giving them time away, and I think the kids value it, too. And raising um, their awareness about yeah. the dangers. Yeah, and I think it comes down to anything in life. I think you know, all of us are educators. Every research ever done says that you're going to, you're, you're more likely to change behavior by uh, educating and convincing people than by uh, taking away. So we're trying to balance that. Um, you know, and on the folks side of the house, for safety reasons, we do take it away. So there's there's specific shops that limit and take it, they get it back, they get it out of their locker or other things at break time or lunch. And does trying to teach that. The employers, when students are on co-op, has there been any negative feedback about cell phone use among our students? I'm thinking no, but just like Yes, ask. there has been. Oh, there has been. Yeah, yeah. I think at the end of the day, they're teenagers. Mm -hmm. So some are having good experiences, and some say they're arguing with it. But you know what? Our at our least, most recent uh, GAC meeting, GAC meeting where there was a big discussion. It was, and some some said it was a problem, and, and some said it was a problem, and others said that's we need social media because it's it's intertwined in our work. Uh, it's past intelligence. Joe's so, point of educating and not taking away. You've got to find that line. Yeah, we, we could get to the point. I think Massachusetts above us, there obviously people are discussing whether just mandating, mandating that. Um, so we'll see where we get. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to work with the students and the teachers and, and support their rules and their decisions in the classes. Okay, we're going to move forward. We're going to have a lot of new here. We're almost there, Mr. Kaling. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. So, what is your report? Mine's going to be super short. Uh, it is um, uh, the policy subcommittee met on February 15th. We reviewed existing policy related to the acquisition of library materials and charged the school librarian, Ms. Scantz Hodgson, with drafting an updated policy that has more clarity, especially around where responsibility lies. And we discussed beginning the process to change graduation requirements in advance of the MCAS potentially being eliminated as a graduation requirement, either by the state legislature or at the polls in November. Uh, Mr. Bianca expressed wariness about investing time and energy without a mandate from the state since there's still uncertainty about what might happen and we agreed to hold off on this issue. That's Thank you. great. Hold on, Mr. Kaylee. Right. Um, can we get a copy of that in our, can you send sure. that to me, please? Yes. No. Um, that's good info. Okay, sorry. Yep, sure. Facilities? Sure. Shop blockers have been installed in printing, health, cosmo, electrical, and cabinet making and the final shop will be machine shop. New bathroom partitions were installed in C building and in the student bathrooms in A building. Electrical service has um, begun to the companion animal building. Small room repair, repairs to an Are we, excuse me, Chris, are we on track to have that online in time? Are we, do we still have that mechanic of the HVAC problem with you have to get a, equipment? a different piece of equipment? We have it, no, we have it now. You have it now? Yeah, we're still on pace by the end of the school year. Okay. 
small room repairs to an office and A building faculty rooms to be completed this week. Um, a deeper cleaning will be taking place um, uh, um, across campus this week as well. And last, all of the many splits um, are in the process of being cleaned this week. Um, you doing that in house, or do you bring some? No, no we brought someone in. Who um, did you bring it in? It is we. They were highly recommended. They're out of Boston, and I cannot think of the name. It's it's. So they specialize in mini splits. That's that's all they do. That's all they do. Correct. And how many on campus now? Thirty-one. Thirty-one. Correct. That's how many units they're servicing. Great. And this will be something that we just automatically, something that... Yeah, no, no, you've got to keep surfacing them. We'll make sure that every month they're service. Once a year or twice a year? Once a year. I spoke with them again today just to verify when they'll be coming back. Okay. Um, and that's all um, Mr. Smith... Do you already have a five minutes? Sure. We have to get Mr. Wilbur on the stage here. I know. That's why I'm... Okay. Okay. I'll link him first. <laughs> Um, treasurer. I've been working with the city treasurer um, to find some programs that will eliminate the amount of cash that um, all of our our instructors, the department heads, um, and the club advisors handle. Um, because of course they're taking the funds in, bringing it to the business office, we're in turn taking it to the bank. So if there's a way that we could possibly work with some kind of credit card system, so I think we might be in line with um, one and having two programs um, try it. So one would be adult ed, and then the second one would be auto. So just doing a trial run, um, and then my goal is to definitely get some of the clubs, especially All right, I thought you got a card of some sort, didn't you? I officially have a card. You school, have a card, card now, yes, but this so is nobody two. else, no program has one yet. This so. is just, at, so when you go to have your card serviced, you can pay with a credit card, because as of right now, it's cash or check only. The restaurant has credit cards. Pardon me? The restaurant has credit cards. The restaurant does, but that's just for the restaurant. Correct. Oh, right. mm -hmm. So um, I think we do have a vendor in mind. Again, I, my goal is to have the club accounts as well. Um, grant procurement is continuing to move along with the second capital skills, um, which also ends June 30th, 24. Um, we'll be assisting maintenance um, to work downstairs in the White House building to allow for when contractors come in. So I know um, Ms. Wanzik and uh, Ms. Kelly were down there handling some of the student records. My staff and I will be down there tomorrow um, working on some more um, leaves some space. Um, also, I did reach out to some of um, some districts to find out who they've used to have um, documents scanned. The Board of Trustee minutes are all still in binders, and my goal is to have them all scanned. I did find a vendor, the, and they were, again, a lot of districts have used them. Um, it's Morgan Record Management. They, um, we have about 38 binders. Um, <laughs> So they do take them off site. Um, we have one project manager that we'll work with. They will do some test runs. We have to approve them before they move on. Um, and then the, all of them will re be returned 14 days after approval. Is there any fear that something happened to our records? Well, there could be fear if we get fired. Yeah, but we, giving them out instead of them doing it being done in house somehow. They're public records. The public records so they could they could ask for them, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm so sure they're a bonded company. All right. So again, the cost for that is about twenty five hundred dollars. That's fantastic. That's well, and of course the there's a way spend, that we right? search them. That's one of the biggest things is we want to be able to get in there and search them and not just so you go into year and you'll be able to pull up each month's meeting and yeah. everything should be there in one also. folder. Maybe search by term. Correct. Like search term. That is correct. Say, I want to know. You, oh, oh. Okay. Oh, they all Fantastic. drop. Okay. Yeah. So that's something that um, I would like, love to move forward with. What are the I have a quick question. <laughs> so where are you getting money for this? Do we need to approve any of this now, or do you got money? Oh, waiting on Dr. Bummer's got a question. No, no. Sorry. Well, it's really on the uh, Northampton side. Do they type the minutes and prepare them for you? No. <laughs> but we are. But 
No, we have a yeah. stride. <laughs> we have depth. But, but is, that, do, is that a service they offer? Do you happen to know? I do not. So they might, Dr. Bott. I would be happy to share this with Maddie um, if you'd like to because that's a good price, the $20 yeah. for that price. Yes. Amazing yes. to yes. digitize. It, it really will be. Again, you just, you know, we all rely on Ms. Carver, you know, our book yeah. historian, but sometimes if we just want to search something, you know, we would have access to it. Um, so, I, you're saying you're trying to put Deb out of a job? Absolutely no. not. No. <laughs> absolutely just they'll not. be available until it's stuck in the The contractors are working out of the basement in the White House? That would, we're possibly, yes, that's, that will save money on renting trailers, trailers yeah. for the rebuild. Mm -hmm. So we do have two offices down there that we need to. And if they survive, that can be our health care facility. Healthcare offices. Just kidding. Oh, no. <laughs> They'll be our canaries. <laughs> our okay, local friends that hang out let's down there. Let's go. So I did reach out to the our outside auditor to request them to come in and audit our last three years of student activity. Um, the economic development bill that we received for two hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. We had to earmark earmark a certain um, amount, Entity. not amount, but a certain vendor. So I did choose SMMA, and we just finally received an invoice that, um, so we're over the 275, so I will be able to submit for that. Oh, awesome. What is our, expe our eventual exposure to SMMA? Do we have a locked-in price, or will that change price, do you know? Currently, based on our design, it's a locked-in price, unless we ask for additional redesign or They've done a lot of work with all the redesign we've done. So they ask for extra money? They have not. No. no have not. And they would have to prepare us for that in Right. Advance, so, right. Well, um, I, don't, I don't know. This may be something happened. But. All right. I'd like to uh, <clears throat> go on. Due to your information, we're going to change and bring Greg up uh, and move him to the top of our uh, new business. Well, thank you. Um, good evening. Well, the building. No, we need to we need to make a big vote here. You want to make the motion? Oh, so you want to make the motion? All right, hold on. Yeah, make the motion. They have a motion and a second to approve the design documents DD for the horticulture building project. Thank you. So I do have no, an update. No, 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 no. Right. I second. There right. you go. We'll make the motion. Oh. I motion. Second. I motion. I motion. Doctor Bonner. Bonner. Any other? Second. Discussion? Well, we're going to not vote, but we're going to bring Greg up for discussion. Craig. Craig. Excuse me. Uh, my name is Craig Wilbur. I am the owner project manager for the Horticultural Building for Smith Vocational, for those who haven't met me. Um, I'm referring to the slide deck that everyone should have in front of them. Um, we're not using the projection for this. Um, so as uh, Dr. Lincoln Hooker mentioned we do have a $1.2 million grant from EEA um, to um, support the, re the build of the horticultural building. Um, the city of Northampton has also had some discussions with, with Andy about potentially providing some infrastructure costs to supply for electrical and generators that will help in the overall budget. So those two are very good news. Um, the 1.2 million that has been offered uh, by the EEA was meant to cover the $950,000 um, gap that was shown in the original design documents and what we had for sources. Um, currently, we have $7.2 million in sources available. The uh, requirements for this grant haven't been fully vetted yet with the EEA, but the slide that shows um, five items um, will be included. Um, that assumes that the entire structure would be wood framed, not prefab metal. It assumes that the insulation would be wood uh, fiber versus a spray foam. Uh, they're looking for white pine siding versus cementitious siding on the outside. And they're looking for interior upgrades uh, where plywood is shown. They would like to use pine, shiplap, wainscoting. 
um, where hardwood baseboard is shown. Um, they want to use local hardwoods for this, and these will have some price implications. We don't know what those are at the moment, but during CD estimating, we will have those numbers for the uh, Board of Trustees to review. Um, so there, the, the 1.2 million, it has to include some additional costs for this wood feature that's being asked for, and there may be some additional asks that we will present as they come out. Um, the important uh, factor is that in the DD estimate that was presented three weeks ago now, um, we do not have these wood products listed. So if there's $200,000 left of the $1.2 million, that money would go towards whatever the upcharge would be for the wood elements that are being um, suggested in this grant. So this will be updated in the next meeting, but um, it does increase our sources and gives us a much more solid um, financial standing. So the next couple discussion points will be on budget. Um, Can I ask a, some, a clarifying question about that? Um, so the wood elements requests so those are essentially the strings that are attached to the money. There you go. They say if you take the 1.2 million, and they, they are do X, y, Z. they're this specific with it. Like they say ship, they, they say eastern white pine siding. They say eastern white pine ship. Yes, they do. They they are specifically calling out local woods that that they are available. Would. They should be readily available to us. So hopefully they did their homework in suggesting that and. It's a great suggestion in reality. Part of the. We have a really good deal in front of us that, um, and there's potential for other stuff down the road that I think it's forcing us to go into the wood framing construction and using the wood as they're suggesting, as opposed to a pre engineered metal building. How common is this in your professional experience? to have a funding source dictate the materials to be used in a construction project? It's fairly common. Uh, in the MSBA, you will find that that's a pretty common theme, that there are For certain sure. conditions sure. and so most other funding sources. Design. They, you get a few designs you get to pick from. You know, yeah. Yeah. So there, yeah, I mean, each funding source does have their own ask, and some of them are stronger and cost more than others. Uh, so this is a pretty normal um, negotiation if you will okay. and we may push back and say certain items may not be available within our, our schedule okay. um, or they may not meet the budget even with the 1.2 million dollar ad that so we that will that was my next question about the um so it, are they saying here's we're going to give you another 1.2 million dollars but you have to use all these materials you weren't going to use before potentially and pay for them with the 1.2 billion 1.2 million dollars is that what they're saying or is they say are they saying hey we're going to give you a number and we're going to tell you some materials and you make it work however yeah, you want no, to no, 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 no. i can jump on so so sean mahoney who is the first contact that we had he's uh, through tcr uh, his his profession is basically an estimator without being an estimator uh, so he went in and met with helen and matt the, the two yeah, uh, that's the best and they went through the AM Fogarty estimate, uh, and they looked at each of the lines of the building materials. And John was able to do, uh, not to the degree of specific, specifics as like AM Fogarty, but they said, okay, if you, this siding that we want you to purchase, mm -hmm. uh, they were, he was able to do the calculations to say that siding will equate to this much money. And then that ship like pine in the shops uh, is gonna cost this much money. So that's how he added everything up to an equal to 1.2 million. So, he tried to do an estimate. Again, it's not overly scientific, which is what Craig was saying. The next estimate, these items would be placed into sort of the, the list of what we need, and then allow AM program to say, okay, now with this material, this is what it's gonna cost. Uh, I, have, I have faith in what Sean, his initial exercise. I think what we're gonna find is this list is gonna be within that 1.2 million. So are, are we getting more? Are, like, are we getting, because it, if it just equals out to 
you know, use these materials that, it's going to cost, that are going to cost you 1.2 million, you were going to spend on it. So well, we were going to spend, so as one, just one example, well, siding. So well, we were going to... I think, I think I know where you're going with this. The only way we get this money is if we do this way. Say we didn't take this money. Yeah. Can we afford the pre-engineered metal building? Correct. No, we can't right now. So it's kind of so forcing... So this money helps us... It's forcing our hand yeah. to mm -hmm. move in this direction. To so use wood, all wood products. What to cut to the chase. What would we do if we didn't get this money? Um, we'd be still struggling. Still struggling. Yeah, we'd be yeah, still struggling. Small, 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 small. We've already pared the building down, and this is the pared down building. With this, we have opportunity to do a really good add alternate would be radiant heat, um, which would be, well, actually, right now, we hope to build it into the budget instead of it being an add alternate. Um, so we have many things to give to John. Do we have a lot, a lot. I, I don't know. I, I do believe he has a hand in it. I tried Lenny calling Roberts. him. What? And Lenny Roberts. Yes, so yes. They, they did help the process behind I the mean, scenes. That, that, we, that was the first I heard about at our last meeting, that there was this possibility of the $1.2 million, unless it existed before. And no, it, it, was, it, was, it was very nebulous before. Gotcha. And now it's, right. become, it's right. become a reality. And so those two people helped make that happen. I, yes, we think they so. Were, they were the so everybody worked really hard on bringing this together. So the money helps us close that budget gap and use their preferred materials and we get the building that we're hoping for. $950,000 to bridge the gap. Say that again. We have 950000 to bridge the gap of what was available in the sources three weeks ago okay. and against the construction cost. Right. Um, and then it gives us another 250000 for these additional asks. So the idea is the 250000 additional covers those added expenses. And we have a discussion back and forth with and the group. And potential money to put at the existing building area. Right. And and an ally to move forward in helping to add the piece the, we the had to cut off the to the, 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 well, the state, the DCR and EEI, EEA, I'm sorry. Um, and that goes back yeah. to the vision. Right. Okay. Um, Thank you for answering all with so much information. No questions. Question. There is some other component here. I'm just yes. There's the, a lot of pieces to it. The other, they, they're looking at our sustainability of the forest of Vice right. Gardens, we of them coming on that. board to make that request that that is protected. Yeah. And at that, we could get additional funds right. in the future. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, that's... Well, <laughs> no, I know what it was. In reality, we would have loved the $12 million timber building, but we came a long way to get where we are today. Gotcha. Yeah, that's fair. Basically in half. <laughs> so, um, at the last Board of Trustees meeting, there was a discussion about doing a market analysis, having a local general contractor do some of their own square foot analysis based off the AM Fogarty design estimate that was given, which at the point was higher than the budget would allow. Um, so basically, the DD estimate, if you take the 5.9, almost $6 million hard costs, add in the soft costs, you end up with a total budget of $7.2 million, just under $7.2 million. And that is about what is available in sources today, uh, give, I think give or take $35,000. The market analysis was done to, to see if the local market would support a lower bid value and give us some opportunity to save money. And that market analysis did come in uh, just about a million point one uh, less than um, Fulgurdy's estimate. Let's be careful not to take that for gospel it is not. It, it is only an estimate based on some very uh, preliminary information, but it does tell me that the local market supports a, a much more competitive bid uh, environment than the Fulgurdy estimate is giving That's a big credit difference. for. Did you, you said $1.2 million? 1.1. 1. 1. 1. Gotcha. So and if so we take... This, this is pretty legitimate, you think? It's as legitimate as you can at this stage in, in design. Design development is still a lot of narratives and assumptions, mm -hmm. um, not a lot of meat and potatoes, if you will. So it, it is the best 
information that we have to date. Um, but what it does do is it gives us an opportunity to examine three different scenarios. The first scenario is that the sources are staying at 7.2 million, mm -hmm. that the Fulgrity estimate is valid and will come in somewhere in the 5.9 to 6 million range. The soft costs that, um, and for those who are interested in knowing the soft costs, the binders, there are two binders there. If you go to section three, it will be um, the soft cost worksheet. And those don't change from scenario to scenario. The soft costs are the soft costs, which are architecture, consulting, environmental, borings, everything, me, and everything else that goes with that. Um, so that market analysis came in just uh, about a million one under what our design development estimate did. So if we look at a medium cost estimate, we're somewhere around $6.6 .6 million. If we see about a halfway point between Fulgerty's estimate and the market analysis. So for today, what I'm asking um, the board to look at is, does the DD budget meet your sources and would you um, be approving of the DD estimate as it is today and moving on to construction documents? The second question is, will wood be accepted or does metal, uh, a metal frame still uh, interest the group? And do we want to go further with that? Well, the way the motion reads is that the design documents, the DD for a horticulture building project, from the explanation that you've given us, one from what Andy has brought forward as far as the financial side of it, by working with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, for us to receive that $7.2 million wood is, the, is what's being presented here for us to use as construction. So I think that's what we have to agree upon. And then uh, second of all is the uh, financial side of what you just explained uh, acceptable to us. So it's, uh, it's one motion but it's going to combine both of those facets. So, can, can you say the questions again for Dr. Bonner? She was out of the room when, oh, sorry. Um, when you posted. You read the two questions that we had to answer, didn't you, just now? What the board needs to do is, I think is Mr. Kaling just summarized it eloquently. Yeah. eloquently. So let's say for Dr. Bonner. Did, did, did you hear what, what What it is in regards to this, <clears throat> the design documentation, DD, for the horticulture building, number one, that motion includes that we would use wood because of the 7.2 uh, money coming from the Commonwealth or excuse me, 1.2. Uh, and then uh, second of all, that the cost would be covered by this DD as well as the way Craig has explained it. So. That's what we're voting on. So moved. We're getting the hang of it. <laughs> <laughs> so moved. And it's getting late. Is there any further discussion? If not, all in favor. Did some did Dr. Bonner second? There was already second. There was already second. There was second. Second. Okay. 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 Excuse me. I want to just check in with the superintendent. You're, you're, you endorse this? Yes. Option? Yes. Can you say why? Of course. Um, and I shared this at the building committee earlier today. Um, I, when we got the uh, the local estimate came in you know, from Western Builders, uh, that was obviously positive news. I felt more comfortable. Um, when the 1.2 million came forward from the state, I was still on the fence. I, I thought a, a metal prefab building still had a lot of positives. Um, but from my vantage point, long term, uh, that phase two aspect of the job. Uh, it would be a lot easier uh, to make a deal with the state if we don't turn down the 1.2 million. Uh, I'm not sure if they would be apt to make a deal if we turn it down the 1.2 million up front. And second of all, I asked the engineering question to the architects that how easy is it to marry a metal building to a wood building in the future? Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. Uh, 
I'd be lying if I said otherwise. But it would make sense, it would be easier if we started with a wood structure and we added a wood structure to a wood structure. So long term, uh, I do see the wood being the best option, honestly. Uh, I am more than, more than comfortable uh, with the budget, uh, which is why I sort of posed earlier in my presentation that uh, no guarantee that we will realize any savings, <clears throat> but we may see some savings, which is a different conversation than we got for a year and a half. Before uh, we didn't realize any savings. Which is savings. why I'm saying that we may have some savings to look at the existing e-building to make yeah. it sustainable. We may have some savings. As, as trustees, you may say, you know, we need to save some money on our tuition revolving right now. So uh, no guarantees, but I am comfortable to say that those are possibilities that we may have down the road by going wood because of the state. Um, so I, I have been, I think all of you know, I've been very nervous about the budget up to this point. Uh, this is the first time I'm not that worried. So. I have a question about um, students and mowers. Um, because that's what started this all. And uh, I'd be lying if I said that wasn't in the back of my mind. Because I'm picturing wood inside the building where students are bringing in equipment that's hot. So I had, but yeah, how, yeah. How, how, how are we preventing that from happening again with, with wood in the building? So I, I, I asked the Excuse me. It started by cloths hanging on the wall. Didn't that's it? correct. Okay? For so it's not like it. a metal wall. In a metal building. The, the, the cloths could have been hanging on the wall in a metal building just as well as they could be hanging on the wall in this old garage building, let's say. And, but and the with it. You know, with the, with the, with the, 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 uh, the insulation would. So I'm not challenging the. It's my. my yeah, no, I see what you're saying. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. that this happened and how, what, what safeguards are in place to prevent that from happening again? Because they may be hanging burlap from the. You're 100% you're correct. There'd be, there'd be drywall, which is more fire resistant than what's, what was there. So no the drywall in the old structure? I don't know. Was there? Or was it exposed framing? If I can just comment on what we're looking at right now. Yeah. I asked the question about a metal prepad building. Could we make this deal? Could, would the state still give us the 1.2 million if, if you as a board said, we want a metal building, can we still have the 1.2 million? Because besides the framing, they're not giving us money for the, the studs. They're giving us money for the wood siding. They're giving us money for the interior wall. Okay, mm -hmm. um, And you could apply the shiplap pine to a metal structure. Mm -hmm. You could technically apply wood siding to a metal structure. So I, I had to ask the question, assuming that somebody on the board is going to ask the question. And is it possible? Yes. So my point is, um, yes, a wood frame is a wood frame. But no matter what, we were going to have plywood on the interior walls of the shop. Mm -hmm. um, and that lawnmower backing up to a plywood wall could catch on fire. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have wood studs or metal studs, that's a different story. What this $1.2 million is asking is that we replace the plywood, which is wood, with wood and chip lot pine. So we're still going to have wood on the interior mm -hmm. no matter the structure. Uh, how do we prevent the next fire? Yeah. Uh, I think we've learned a lot of lessons as far as storage. Yeah. I think we've learned a lot of lessons around uh, not storage, of the, not even storage of the walls, but also storage of the equipment, yeah. uh, proper spacing. I think one of the big discussions we've had within the building committee is just the size of the shop area, the depth of the shop area. Uh, is it deep enough to get the equipment that we need in without it butting up against the interior mm -hmm. wall? So, I think we've learned our lessons. Uh, I think code nowadays is more stringent as far as what is on the wall to be more fire retardant. Mm -hmm. um, so it was interesting, the CLT, this was a, a conversation back when we were looking at the $12 million project. Um, and the CLT, which is wood, is actually has a higher fire retardant rating than metal. Mm -hmm. um, metal can melt. Uh, so, so not increasing our liability. It's we will have a here, safer building, even with wood. And we, we know better. Correct. The new building construction has fire protection, so there'll be a wet sprinkler system installed in the new building. And there wasn't one in the other one? No, no it was years old. Yeah, it's code. And it wasn't required. required. But we didn't have to do it retroactively? No. 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 Wow. no. Okay. But new building you will, so you no. will have a fire protected building that... Yeah, good point. Right. Um, and great answer, Andy. 
Did that answer all your questions? Oh, I, I mean, I think no, I no, understand. No, that, that was a great yeah, question, I, actually. You know, you want to be able to feel safe. Explain all of the factors that people are going to ask you about, and yeah. that's certainly it's a big one. Is the, they, they know how the fire started. Mm -hmm. Okay, again, we have a motion. We have a second to approve the design documentation DD for the horticulture building project. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, Craig. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Under new business. No. We have a motion and a second to approve to award under Massachusetts General Law 130 the Acts of 2005 an honorary diploma to Korean War veteran Mr. Richard Duncan. So moved. Second. Further discussion? Thank you so much for the letter, and I'm so glad I have been able to do this. And it's a neat connection for my associate principal who got the standing ovation when it's been added. Um, yeah. Wonderful. And I hope no further you discussion. Time. No further it's discussion. Awesome. All in favor? Aye. 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 May I have a motion and a second to approve purchasing a table of 10 for the annual St. Patrick's Day breakfast at the Hotel Northampton for $250 from the trustee's account. So moved. Second. Is there any further discussion? Yes, I'm three quarters Irish and love the event. It's such a positive event. <laughs> it's so fun to see the happiness, to see the mayor, do whoever the mayors do their thing, all that. Um, I uh, have uh, struggled to connect the St. Patrick's Day breakfast to the mission of the school. I don't see how it directly benefits our students and our stipends. We got a hefty increase to $9,300. May, may I explain? Sure, but uh, $9,300, I my preference would be for that to, to be uh, purchased by a trustee, maybe in the name of Smith Vocational, but um, for me, it's... I love the event, um, as I said, and I'm very Irish myself. But I don't, I don't connect it to the mission, and it's, it's. Pretty what it is is public relations. First of all, we've been doing it for many years, even before me. Second of all, is our students, including last year, got awards at the breakfast from the St. Patrick Association. So it does have direct connection to our students. I disagree with that. So uh, all I'm asking for is for an annual uh, public relations in regards to, as you said, being involved in the community. We go and we attend the Chamber of Commerce uh, events monthly that they arrive at five for public relations in regards to some of the vendors that we send our students to go to work are at these events and we work with them. Banks that are giving us money uh, towards the fire are at those events. So it's no different. We are being out in the public in regards to this event to be able to say that we participate with the city of Northampton and that's the reason why we do it. I'm uncomfortable having my ethnic group privileged over others. That's all. And I, again, respectfully disagree with you. They have St. Right. Joseph's. They hold, have hold on, Polish hold on, hold on. Best I respectfully appreciate both your your concerns. So I guess the best thing is to find other ethnic groups we can contribute to. Mm -hmm. um, I, I agree with Mr. K. Lane's PR approach. I think it's huge. I, I understand your concern. Um, but I think in the bigger picture, it does it does serve a purpose for the students overall. And I bet you even some of the students probably work the event. They do. Hello here. So again, you can say I, hey, uh, I, I motion. Okay. So we have a motion purchasing a table of 10 for the St. Patrick's Day breakfast, $250 from the trustee's account. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. 
May I have a motion and a second to approve the use? On the record, do you want to say that, May? Yes. Okay. Just yeah. for the record. Sure. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. May I have yes. a motion and a second to approve the use of funds from a trustee's account to host the North Ham Chamber of Commerce Arrive at Five event on March 6th, 2024, not to exceed the amount of $1,800. So moved. Second. Further discussion? Can you tell me what this event is? I just... Yes, well, <laughs> the Chamber of Commerce uh, monthly has what they call an Arrive at Five, where local businesses come in at five o'clock at night and they gather and it's for uh, networking. Network a networking event between the companies mm -hmm. and it has exposure where they have sponsors that uh, sponsor these events. So not only will we be hosting it, but there will be other companies that will sponsor it to help reduce the cost in regards to the presentation. We've done it before. It's great exposure for our school and uh, and our students. We, we will do all the food for the culinary and they will take care of uh, the event that way. We are not going to have any alcohol served during this event. It's strictly uh, soft drinks for water only. I can ask some details. Right, yeah, the planning behind it. Uh, so the specific motion, I think, for Dr. Bonner's uh, question, the $1,800 is a quote that we received from culinary. Uh, so the the, resp the financial responsibility of all the food is on the host. Us being the host, we have to buy all the food at a cost, obviously. So that's what you see in front of you. Uh, the, the event sponsor happens to be Kaiser Construction. Uh, just to, for total transparency, their sponsor, I'm not sure what type of financial impact they have, uh, but that money is not helping offset the, the food costs. That's on us, okay? Uh, but the the potential promotion, uh, the, the positives that we gain out of this is that we have an opportunity to, to showcase the school. Um, I'm sure trustees that are in attendance will, will speak on behalf of the school. Uh, my plan is to, to play the SMMA video that I share with the board. You know, the highlights the school, highlights the, the building project. I think it's a great six minute video. Uh, we plan on playing that. Uh, we also have some door prizes uh, in talking to some of our shops. Uh, they provided some, uh, like an ironic chair, or some, some piece of equipment that the machine students made. So again, a chance to, to give uh, part of the school out to the community. And then lastly, I want to thank uh, Mr. Bianca and Ms. Shardier uh, and working with uh, the graphics department. You know, told the staff, it's almost like our fair prep in the fall. Uh, it's almost like a fair prep for this particular uh, event. And they've been working hard on uh, Kind of the banner idea, but if you've been to the fairs recently, you know we have these trifold posters, okay, uh, that are sort of falling apart. We are investing in these pull-up banners. We'll have pictures. So 15 shops will have these 15 pull-up banners. Uh, they should be ready for that evening. So it's a great chance to sort of highlight the school. But the actual cost that you're voting on is for the actual food that culinary will be putting on. So I just want the board to know that. What um, you said, promotional uh, graphic type stuff. We did the, what we talked about earlier, the billboard of all the supporting co-op companies. Be that banner's uh, in the cafeteria. So the, the event will be in the cafeteria. That okay. banner's already up in the cafeteria. So that will people be able to see these, all these yes. businesses have co-op students per Are they breaking out the yeah. white table cloths? Hmm? I'm sorry? Are they breaking out the white table cloths? I'll have to talk to the chef. It improves the look of the cafeteria. Sure. Yeah. He does want to, uh, his goal right now uh, is to use some of his students uh, to be Server. servers, uh, which would be a nice addition. Yeah. And the evening culinary program. Uh, yes, the adult did, yes. Thank you. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. On, uh, Paul Harvey, page two. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> about the mass culture. That's what I'm doing right now. Oh, okay. May I have a motion and a second to approve a reimbursable grant. We put the money up front and then get reimbursed for $1,265. 765 
$1,265. Are you different? That's narrow on that agenda. This one's wrong? Yep, mine too. Can you give me a correct figure? It's $1,765. Thank you. To the Mass Cultural Council Small Brand for the Viking Randstone, which is a book. So moved. Second. Dr. Lincoln, over, that's your money tree. Yeah. I see that runestone on this agenda more often than any other. Mm -hmm. Further money. discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 May I have a motion to second or approve to surplus for scrap blood pressure cuffs and stethoscopes from Health Technologies? So moved. Second. Further discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Future business, March 26th, 2024, regular board of trustees here. April 9th, regular board of trustees meeting here. And Dr. Bonner will... Make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.